Okay. Hold on a second. Okie doke, testing, testing one, two, three. All right, everyone, welcome back to a Friday night live stream. Hopefully we are coming through loud and clear, and I do emphasis clear. We have been struggling with a microphone issue for quite some time now, so um, I made a little bit of a repair on the, on the Rode microphone, well, and it decided to go poo poo on me right before the stream, like five minutes ago, so uh, had to, make a quick derailment of time and switch to an untested mic. So we'll have to see how this one works out um, for this purpose. But uh, anyways, let me know how everybody's saying if I'm coming through loud and clear, Jessica, and let's go ahead and do a camera check over at the Anvil cam when you get a second. So there we are, we're at the Anvil, getting ready to get all set up over here. And uh, we can go back to the main cam. And thank you, by the way, uh, you said it was Ghost Forge Company or Ghost Forge, thank you for the $10, uh, $20 super chat, wasn't it? Yes, the $20 super chat to turn that sign a different color. I greatly appreciate that. Also a euro from Gordon Farmer. Hey, and a euro from Gordon Farmer. Well, thank you, Gordon Farmer, for the euro, uh, one euro super chat. We appreciate it. So yeah, uh, getting the streams started off to a good good note, hopefully. We'll Okay, it sounds and looks good. That's the main important part. Um, Jessica, how are you doing this evening? Let's go over to you. I am doing good. It's like a little little TV transition. Over to you, Jess. Uh, <laughs> doing good. As you see, um, all our snow melted off. So I forget, two weeks ago, I forget if we had snow on the ground. We did, because I remember everybody was mentioning the flux. So we are snow free, but still sitting probably in the 20 degrees uh, temperatures this evening. So uh, that's why we're bundled up. Oh, you're a little exaggerated. It's not 20 degrees in here. It's like 42 <laughs> and dropping, but it is like, it's not 20 degrees. <laughs> and who over exaggerates things? I'll tell you what, she's on to me all the time about that. I'll tell you what, fellas and ladies. Mm-hmm. All right, so, uh, so anyways, welcome. Welcome to the shop. If you haven't seen the last three streams that we have done, uh, you can go back through and watch those if you want to get caught up to this point, you want to follow along. But we've got our arm or our cross arm bar for our sign bracket, our decorative sign bracket done. And we also have, hopefully they can see this all on there and that's coming through good. Yeah. Um, and we've got our back plate completely finished up. So we punched this in the second video in the series here. We went ahead and punched this and drifted it and then did the tin in and the decorative in and the punching on this arm. That's, that was in the second one. And then on the first stream, we went ahead and made up this bracket to begin with, at least one end of this bracket. So um, again, if you wanna go all back through, you can check that out. Let's go to camera number two, Jess. I wanna show people what I've done here. So basically, I followed through with what I said on the last stream is that I was going to file this down nice and square so this way it would fit nicely together our tenon joint there so so that fits up nicely we've got that ready to go it's really hard to show this whole thing off in the frame uh, as we go here uh, but that's what we're going for now i'm not actually going to rivet this whole thing together i'm not going to pin this to the back plate just yet because i need to one make some mounting holes for this to mount against the wall. And two, I wanna make sure that I get my scroll work together and all the pieces are lining up how I like them. So if I need to make any adjustments in the length of this, I can do so without it already being riveted to the back plate. Uh, so that's kind of the key there. So we can go back to the main cam. So tonight we're gonna to be working on, and can they see this just clear enough? Is, is that pretty clear they can see the scroll work? Oh, so tonight we're going to start the work on the scroll work and we will probably finish the scroll work in another evening. So um, we will 
We will do the forge welding of the scroll work all together in another evening, but we are going to start the individual elements of the scroll work tonight, and we'll see how far along we get um, along with all the door prizes and things that we have for you being here and joining us on a Friday evening. Not like you're going anywhere else in this big old world, but unless you're essential, <laughs> unless you're an essential human being to life itself as we know it, um, you are stuck at home like the rest of us non-essential human beings. So congratulations, good to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so who do we all have, Jess? And then we'll get, I'll get into some more of the deeper conversation. Yeah. Um, well, I will go into who we have here in a moment. Uh, looks like we have 54 viewers currently joining us. And we also had another Euro Super Chat from Gordon Farmer, as well as um, a super sticker from Yamas that was a, uh, like a little island with an umbrella. Yamas, that's perfect for you. Thank you, Yamas. <laughs> And then there was also a super chat from Doe Creek Forge, um, who was asking about forging brass. Just a second. It says, trouble forging brass, it's cracking. Is there any advice? So with brass, you need to be making sure that you're actually forging the correct grade of brass. You need to look for a naval brass or brass anything that would have been put in sheet or plate format. Um, if, it's a pl if it came from a plate or a sheet of material, there's, a good there's good odds that that is naval, what they consider naval brass. A lot of your bar stock type brass or things that you'd see in bar stock and some of those other things, that is a, that is a grade of brass that is only meant to be machined and not forged on. So uh, it has a very low mal malleability in the temperature range in order for you to be able to hot work it is very narrow. So it's almost red short. If you're having a lot of cracking, if you're having a lot of cracking, usually that is the case. Um, a lot of times if it's a naval brass, you can heat it and kneel it and you can work it cold if you're having cracking issues. The other end of that spectrum, if you get it too hot, it'll crumble on you just like cottage cheese and you know you got it too hot. So you have to, there's a really narrow window there for forging brass and it has to be the correct grade of brass. So uh, it might be, might be helpful for you to go check in to see what you have actually, see if you can send off a sample of it to somewhere that could check it. Sometimes a local scrap yard will check it for you. Sometimes they charge you and sometimes it's for free. Um, look into that because I've got brass in the past that was bar stock, but it was machine only. The grade of brass was machine only. It had really high levels of zinc in it and other things that just made it really easy to turn on a lathe, but horrible, horrible uh, for forging. It had zero forging or malleability properties to it. So uh, yeah, that's my answer to that. Hopefully that helps. And thank you for the super chat, everyone. Thank you. Oh. What else? Who else we have in here? Sure. Um, it looks like we have a lot of our regulars. We have um, Ben Toombs, Yamas, of course, Eric Bracken, um, Aaron Dennis, Oddwood Forge, Green Bee Blacksmithing, Dog Bone Knives, just to name a few. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, welcome, everybody. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. It's been an absolute gorgeous day here in Michigan. Um, earlier today, it was up in the 50s, I think it was, uh, today. It was, well, yesterday it was up in the 50s. Today it was pretty warm, too. Uh, yeah, today it was pretty warm, too, as well. Um, I enjoyed it. I, think it. I think it got close to 50 when I looked at it. It was like 52 or something like that on my phone um, earlier today. So pretty nice, pretty nice. You gotta love this kind of weather or, uh, you know, getting there well before it gets hot. So that's a good thing. And it didn't really get that hot up here in northern Michigan um, last year when we were up here for the summer. It didn't, I mean, it didn't get over, it had what, one day? Like one day? Yeah, I memorized it. It was July 19th, it got 89 degrees. <laughs> Woo, smoking hot. <laughs> and I didn't do any work on that day. <laughs> I played hooky. I'm like, nah, I don't have to sweat it out today. And then the next day it was like 75. So I'll take it, <laughs> I'll take it. 
So let's get right into our project here, unless there's any questions or any other things I need to address. Um, Are we on my mic? Okay. I will mention again that we that we do have some giveaway items uh, that we'll be giving away this evening, and uh, in the next week's live stream will be another Anvil giveaway live stream. So be looking forward to that if you're here. Um, yes, there was one other question on brass, and was there any advice on melting brass in a crucible for various uses? No advice on melting brass. I am not a foundry person or a casting person. The best thing I know is that you're supposed to add some zinc to it and some other stuff if you're casting it. I, it, I couldn't tell you. I really couldn't tell you. There's, there's like percentages of stuff you're supposed to break up and put in with it in order to get it to cast properly. Last time I tried to cast brass, uh, it was porous and nasty and had all sorts of inclusions in it and like you name it. So it, it didn't go out very well for me. So I can't really explain a whole lot on the brass casting uh, spectrum of things. Um, there, is, there is one person that works a lot in casting. His name, um, uh, it's Clark, isn't it, at Windy Hill? Um, there's a YouTube channel you can check out here on YouTube. Um, it's Windy Hill Foundry. It's Clark over at Windy Hill Foundry. If you go check him out, he would probably be a good source of information because he's like casting every single day cast iron and other things. And he's like a, a, a smaller shop, a smaller casting shop. And he's, really, he's a really friendly dude. So uh, look him up. That's Windy Hill Foundry. Um, definitely go check him out and uh, I'm sure he would be better at answering those type questions because I think he's played with all those things or he can at least point you to the right person <laughs> uh, of who would know all right we good yeah. okay all right let's get into it so I have my pieces of material here that we're going to be using for the scroll work as I've said before, curves eat up a lot of material. The material here that you see here will be this larger scroll right here, the center scroll, the main element, if you will. That's, what, that's how much material that scroll will need, is this entire length of bar stock. Also, the little smaller scrolls will take up about that much length of bar stock, just so you guys can get an idea. Hopefully they can see it. And they see that okay against the backdrop? Yeah. Yep. That's fine. Okay. That's about how long of material it's going to need for those when I, uh, you know, jump weld those on. How I got to that measurement of whatever that bar stock was, and here's the little trick, if you will. It's an old trick. Everyone's used it before. Is you can use wire. So what I've got here instead of wire, I like using solder. If you can, this is like your standard plumbing silver solder. You can pick it up at any Home Depot, Lowe's, or anything like that. But this is really nice. Let me go over here, grab this real quick. Scrolling tongs. This is really nice because you can take a pair of pliers, like a pair of scrolling tongs, and you can go to your pattern and you can roll this up either by, you know, just finger pressure or hands or whatever, and you can adjust it towards your pattern here and you can roll something like this all the way around and find out exactly how much material you need for that project. One of the better things than silver solder, although a lot more toxic to your health, is lead, a lead solder. Lead is really nice because you don't even need, well, I mean, you could just see it drooping, hopefully. You can just see how it's just drooping down like that. It has no rigidity in it, and therefore you can just grip a hold of this and just, you know, bend it around with your fingers super easily. Um, it takes almost no force to do that, and you can very quickly find it. So a lot of times you can go to garage sales and find an old plumbing box that somebody did some soldering one day, you know, back when they used lead to solder pipes. <laughs> well, you can usually find stuff like that for like 50 cents for a roll or, or something of it. Um, of that nature. But again, um, it's considered bad for your health um, and has been proven 
bad for your health. So I'm not endorsing you to use lead solder for this process. It's probably safer to go with the modern vari variety of plumbing solder that you can get. I find this to be very helpful in creating complex scroll forms and figuring out the length that you have there. I've showed several different methods of this. One of the other ways that you can calculate is to get a pair of dividers, wing dividers, set them at a set increment in half inch or inch increments, and then just walk the dividers around the pattern as you go, and that will get you fairly close to what you need to as well. Um, keep in mind that even with doing the wire method, like I'm showing here, wire method, or doing the divider method, it is a still a little bit of guesswork. It takes a little bit of technique and finesse to kind of know when you got just the right amount of material there. Because you could say, okay, um, yeah, I need to do this, but that's not taking into account. This material here isn't taking into account of the thickness of your bar stock. So sometimes it's helpful to do some math as well. Um, but that's up on you. So it's a little bit of a guesstimate, but you can get really, really close with the estimate on estimating how much scroll material uh, you need. Remember, you can always cut a little off or scroll up a little bit more on a scroll than it, and that's easier than trying to stretch a little bit more out. So always go a little heavy on the material for the scrolls. Um, but I cut this at exactly the length that those rolled out to, and we'll see how these turn out. Any questions? Yeah, there's a few other um, materials that were questionable if you could do the same thing. One was a coat hanger, another one was copper wire, and another one was like fence wire. So yeah, all those are very viable options. Um, one thing I would advise against on the copper wire, the only reason why I would advise against the copper wire is because copper wire work hardens. Um, so when you're, when you have several bins to make and lots of things like that, as you're working with the wire, maybe you got it all rolled up on a spool and then you're laying it out on your design, it's work hardening constantly um, as you do that. And by the time you get done with all your scroll work, it can become quite a pain in the butt to deal with the copper wire side of things. Um, so that's the only reason why I would advise against it. Um, other than that, you can definitely use it. Um, any sort of wire could work like that. You just have to put a little extra effort into it. Lacing wire for like fencing, that's a really great alternative as well. It's steel. Eventually it will work harden and break. So, you know, and it'll become difficult to work with too. So um, just, uh, just keep that in mind. Where solder, solder doesn't work harden. It just, it doesn't. <laughs> it, doesn't it doesn't really work hard, harden. So, um, you can bend it almost indefinitely, especially lead solder. That's why I like the lead, lead solder, because you can just bend it as much as you like and it never work hardens. So, and I see all the super chats. Thank you all. Um, yes, the, the yellow one was from Aimless Adventure. Says, finally took three times to get through. Uh, glad that you're finally able to get it to work. <laughs> And also the most recent one was from Yamez. Um, it was a rose. And yeah, thank you, Yamez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad for the roses. <laughs> so is that the official rose color? Um, yeah, I think sometimes the signals get mixed and it's supposed to send a certain color and it, um, s sometimes it gets it mixed up. Well, it's, it's, it's there. <laughs> It might be a surprise. Maybe it'll be a disco color. I know Yamas likes blue, so every time he super chats, he's trying to make it blue. <laughs> so it didn't work for you, Yamas. I don't know what the. <laughs> so Will Patrick says so to recap, we draw the scroll design, then we use twine, wire, etc. to trace out the length of the required material, then use that wire to determine our bar stock length. Does that sound correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, again, like I said, this is an estimate. If you have really thick bar stock, 
it's, it's, going, it's going to change a little bit. You have to make sure that you draw your pattern to the thickness of the material that you're going to use. In this case, I am using about whatever that pencil length is, which is about eighth inch material. Well, it's, yeah, it's about eighth inch thick material by half inch wide bar stock. So it's, I don't have, I don't have a lot of thickness to contend with, but say if it was like half inch, or five eighths inch square bar that you're gonna turn around, you have to measure the center line of that scroll in order to get it accurate. Because if you go around the outside of that half inch or five eighths inch bar stock, you're gonna get a different diameter than if you go around the inside of that half inch bar stock. So you have to go through the center of your scroll piece. So you can't just follow the line, so to speak. So that's the only thing that will matter. Um, that That's the only thing that'll, create a difference for you and you maybe not come out with the right length of material. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, for, this, for this first little bit, I'm heating up the end here, just trying to focus on the end. And I'm going to give it just a little bit of an upset and then with some back face hammer blows and then I'm gonna to try to spread it out a little bit into a bit of a fishtail scroll. Not a bunch, just a little bit of a fishtail scroll and then we're gonna do some decorative fullering work before we roll this up into a scroll. So hopefully that makes sense. Any more questions, Jess? Sure. And you made it blue, Yamez. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, there was, uh, let's see, Yamez sent a super sticker of a banana and then that was followed up with um, a euro or a pound, sorry, pound from Gordon Farmer and also a $5 super chat from Oddwood Forge who says, make it green. It did just turn green. Ta -da! Ask and you shall receive my friend. So thank you all. Thank you very much for supporting the channel. We do greatly appreciate it. And I can say I definitely appreciate it even more considering YouTube has decided that my channel is not worth watching for some reason. It's not sending our videos out to very many people. So, um, uh, our views are down. Yeah, yeah, we got only got 73 people in here. So YouTube probably hasn't sent out the notifications again. So, um, so good time to share it. If if you want mine, we greatly appreciate that. But stuff like that helps uh, tremendously support us and what we're doing here, even when YouTube is being butts. <laughs> Pantaloons they're being. Oh, all right. We're hot. Let's go over to the anvil real quick, and then I'll take on whatever other questions. But we want it nice and hot for this operation. It's going to want to bend up on you. Just trying to add a little bit of mass to it on the end. Now this is changing the length of the scroll because I am shortening the scroll somewhat. But when I start doing the spreading operation to this, it's going to stretch back out. So. Um, it kind of cancels itself out. So I'm just adding thickness to the end of the bar. So this way it'll create a little bit of a swell or a little bit of a fishtail when I spread that out a little bit better. So this is fairly thin stock, so don't expect it to stay hot for very long. Back in the fire. What else you got going on, Jess? Um, yes. Somebody told me, uh, yes, Gordon Farmer, that is not a euro, it's a pound. Yes, I sh should have known that. Thank you for refreshing my memory. Um, and then Yamez um, tried to turn it blue again, but it didn't work. It did turn red before before Gordon Farmer's, uh, but he has a wait for it. What's his super sticker? <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Yamez. Thank you, Gordon. Appreciate you all. All right, so um, does anybody have any questions about the process so far? Uh, I don't think I missed any earlier on, but it's possible I did. So if I did, just bring them up again. All right, ready? Let's go over the anvil. Okay, we're gonna go to the anvil and now we're gonna flip it over to our cross pin and we're just gonna slightly flare the end. We don't want to lose too much mass and thickness here 
we just want to slightly flare the end without losing a bunch of thickness. We need to keep some of that thickness in the bar for the next operation. Now I should say this, if you are attempting this, oh they can still hear me over all my hammering here. The audio is probably clipping a bit, but uh, you don't have to do this. You can just do a flat ribbon scroll, you could do a half penny scroll, you could take and do all sorts of different scrolls. Snub ends, you could do it out of different thickness of bar stocks. Really, um, the stylization choice is up to you. I'm just choosing to do a particular style of scroll that I find pleasing or that I want to do. So don't feel like you're locked into what I'm doing here if you're following along. You can work at whatever makes you feel good. Whatever skill level or wherever you're at in smithing or tools that you have available, go ahead and use those. You don't necessarily have to use everything that I have. So if you don't have it on hand, don't worry about it. Just make, make it your own and unique, if you will. Doe Creek Forge, thank you for the $2 super chat. He says, Roy Rand. And then so I asked if he had a, a topic in mind. Um, also, Chewy, Rick Nicholas, thank you for the $2 super chat. He says, I got the notification and I truly appreciate the info. Very welcome. I'm glad to teach it. Thank you all for the super chats. Really do appreciate that. Oh. And of course, Mr. Coffee had to come in and turn it uh, orange. He said, okay, kids, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Coffee. It is a pleasure as always, sir, to have you in the shop. <laughs> Charming Hollow Forge asks if you use the golden ratio for scrolls. Um, I personally do not. So, uh, and I'll just say that I personally do not because there's a lot of people I guess this could be a rant. I guess you could say it's a rant. It's not really a rant. It's not like you got strong feelings about it. A lot of people get too caught up in the designing of stuff and then you realize that you're not a perfect smith. So I have seen guys that have two years of blacksmithing experience under their belt and they are a wealth of knowledge. They can calculate the diameter of the sun and the whatever and how the moon and the stars work and they'll put, you know, they put all this information together and all these factoids about smithing and stuff and then they can't even form a proper scroll properly. Um, the, way that I, the way that I use for my scrolls is what looks pleasing to my eyes. That's basically it. And as far as the golden ratio, and that I don't really bother with that a whole lot. I draw on what I want, then I measure that out for the proper amount of material, and then I go from there. And oftentimes, if it doesn't quite look right once I get it down, I'll adjust. I might tweak something a little tighter. I might say, hey, you know what? That needs to be uh, you know, curled up a little bit better, and I will go from that direction uh, when I work at it. So. Um, you know, if you want to use a golden ratio, that's really great on paper, but as soon as you step into the forge, it, your golden ratio goes out the window because you're not a perfect <laughs> human being. You're not a perfect smith, right? So that, that's kind of my thoughts, or that's kind of my approach, I guess, if you will. Now, I'm sure there's probably some old masters that are like spinning in their graves right now. <laughs> Hear me talk that type of nonsense. Uh, they're like, he's not telling it right. But um, yeah, just a lot of the older ironwork I've seen and things, nothing is perfect. Nothing's perfect. In fact, it's very much not perfect. It's, and if it looks too perfect, it just looks really manufactured and it just looks weird. It doesn't look good to the eye, you know, because you could draw in a perfect perfect scroll but it's in a converging place on say a railing and it may not look good <laughs> it may not look good there it might adhere to all the principles but it would help if it had something else to it or maybe it took a different path um, than what has been drawn and sweated over for eons um, and, and that's kind of where the artistic eye comes into play there's definitely a method of making it correct making a good looking scroll but yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Great question, Hans. Lovely question. And hello, sir. Good to have you. 
<laughs> so, all right, I'm ready to go over the anvil, Jess, and then we can take any questions after that. Okay, so now I've got myself a little quarter inch radius fuller, and I'm gonna come down this piece on basically one side of that fishtail, and I'm gonna hug one side of this bar stock. There we go. Got a little bit of a, hopefully you can see that groove running. Okay. I'll come out and I'll go ahead and counterbalance that with another piece running down the opposite side of the bar stop. And again, this is a, is it on me? Yeah. Okay. Again, this is where you get to kind of do, let your own artistic freedom run. You could do a center fuller, you could do no fuller. You could do cross hatching, you could do just some texture. You kind of really make it what you want and just kind of play with it and see what looks good to you and then uh, make the piece your own. Which I believe that's one of the funnest things about blacksmithing is that, uh, that freedom to express yourself in the way that you do see fit. And thank you to all the super chats that had come through. I had noticed the sign changed. Uh, there's a question uh, about the project and what size is it that you were working on there? And also, is that a fishtail scroll? Yeah, so this is, a, is kind of a fishtail scroll. It's kind of a cross between a fishtail and a ribbon scroll, but classic, classically it would be considered a fishtail scroll because of the way that it fishtails out. So um, you can, uh, the size material is eighth inch by half inch material. Um, so that way it fits within the confounds of my framework or to the underside of my cross arm bar. So I want it to fit to the underside of this and not overhang. You don't want it to be out wider than your bar. It's okay if it's a little under the size of your bar, it's a little narrower than your bar, that's okay. But you don't want it to hang out the outside. Um, so this was the closest thing I had that could work. So it's half inch wide by eighth inch thick or 13 mil by three mil, four mil ish. Three and a half to four mil, okay? Doe Creek Forge says, um, for the Roy Rant, it could be something from the heart. I like to know what you think. And that was followed up with a um, poop emoji super chat from <laughs> Aimless Adventure. Poop emoji. Yeah. That could make a funny Roy Rant slash story as we actually have one of those little emoji ornaments in the other side of the shop uh, that we're going to use for a funny little project. Yeah. It was going to be a skit about trolls, but I decided to play like I'm better than that, resorting to petty things, but who am I kidding? I'm not better than that. I'll resort to petty squabbles. <laughs> oh. Let's go over the anvil, Jess. Uh -huh. All right, to the legs here. And I'm going to do it again. Other side. I'm just going to follow right down the vein. That side. Been helpful if I could have put this. If I had another camera, huh? Correcting where it wandered a bit. All right, hopefully, y'all can see that. Looks good. All righty. Keep heating it up and going here. I did get. Now here's one of the troubles of if you're working with unknown material. This is scrap material that I bought off of another blacksmith. 
Um, so I don't really know where this stuff has come from um, or what it was in its previous life. But uh, I, don't, I don't really know what, what it was that it came from or what it was in its previous life. And I got a small little split happening on the end. So I have pushed it a little far for the material. But it's okay, it's not at a point right now it's that I would have to start, stop and start over. It's just something that I have to monitor and make sure I don't make worse. Otherwise, if I make it any worse, we'll have to start over <laughs> on another piece of bar stock. Which I'm hoping we won't have to do that. Really hoping we won't have to. All right, well you got a moment while that's heating up. Uh, thank you, Dana, for the $25 super chat. He says, this is from my wife, my wife, Eve. Thanks for everything you do. Very welcome. Thank you, Dana, for everything you do. Thank you for all that, uh, all the great sticker packs. So, super appreciated. Let's go back to the anvil. Good and hot. So I've got a little bit of crud stuck to it here. So I'm going to brush that real quick. Get rid of it. And then... I'm going to, again, aim right down the piece. I'm trying to widen this out a little bit and stay right on the edges. So I'm working to both sides of my center line as I go back. And we're going to clean it up. And I'm hoping to leave a ridge right in the center. Just trying to clean that up a little bit. Hopefully you guys can see how it's starting to progress. Look good? Yeah, sure does. Okay. So we're gonna keep that going for probably, oh, I would say probably another three or four inches at least to go down here. Remember, this material eats up a lot of material. So to scroll this is going to eat up a lot of material. We'll probably go about another three inches or so and we'll call it good at that because we have to do the same exact thing to the other end of the bar. So now it's a full proper fishtail scroll. See it? Hopefully that looks good. And I'll have to come through here and just kind of clean this up a little bit. Could have done a little tidier job right in here. And so we'll just clean that up with the fuller as we go. But again, I'm watching this little end split. There's a little end split right here on the very end. And uh, I want to be definitely uh, cognizant of that. Um, what I will probably do is, in the scrolling process, I'll give this a little bump with the hammer, and that'll close that little seam up to where you don't notice it. And on a large piece like this, a large scale piece like this, you can kind of get away with hiding some of your mistakes like that. And, uh, you know, you're okay. We have a question from Chewy. He says, um, and thank you also for the super chat. He says, do you have any suggestions on where to get steel? Um, so that is the question as old as time itself. Where to get good steel? Um, I'm always going to go to my go-to place, which is try to find a scrap yard that'll deal with you. Um, that is where you're gonna find the cheapest prices usually. It's where you're gonna find the most diverse amount of steel. Usually they don't have things segregated out by like, oh, this is high carbon steel or this is low carbon or this is mild or this is that or what have you. So sometimes you can get some really pricey steel that otherwise you would have had to spend thousands of dollars to buy or hundreds of dollars per bar and you can pick it up for 50 cents a pound or 59 cents a pound or whatever they got it going for, um, which you would never be able to do with brand new material. So uh, sometimes you can find axles and shafting and you name it down at a scrap yard. So uh, I would hunt a scrap yard if you can. Second to that, um, you can always buy new. 
And I would always suggest to try to get in on a co-op with somebody and buy a lot of stock from a place like Alro or uh, Benjamin Steel if you're in the US or whatever, and try to get a lot of steel all at once and then split it up, kind of do a co-op situation. Um, that's a great way of getting a price break by buying tonnage you can get a price break and everybody can go, go home with quite a few linear foot of steel that'll last them from here till whenever. Another one that I've seen here recently, there's been some pop-up places on like Facebook Marketplace and things that I have seen uh, that are offering, you know, steel by the foot or, you know, so much per pound or whatever. So there's also that opportunity as well, where, it's, you know, maybe a shop, a big welding fab shop bought a bunch of steel in for a project, didn't use all of it. And instead of scrapping it for one cent per ton or whatever it is now, it's awful low. Um, instead of scrapping it for such an insanely cheap price, they're choosing to sell it off right now. So uh, it might be helpful to search within a hundred mile radius of you on say like a marketplace or something like that. All right, this is getting hot. Let's go to the anvil. So this first part's pretty relaxing. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot to it. It might even be considered boring a little bit to some, just because you're not, there's not a lot of met material transformation. Um, but in a lot of higher end iron work, there is an intense focus on setup. So, you know, it's good to set yourself up for the next heat, the next heat, the next heat. And that's kind of the mark of craftsmanship is, you know, in that setup work, how much time you're willing to put in the setup work before you scroll something up. So that's really up to you, right? Like you can put as much or as little time into something as you'd like, um, but it's more valuable in the long run when you pay attention to the little things. Just little details like what I'm doing right now really change not only the value of a piece, but the whole look and dimension and scope of the work you do. So um, just keep that in mind. So that's progressing nicely. The last super chat we had came in from Brian Howman, who says, can I get a shout out for my forge, Howman Forge on Facebook? Been super inspired by y'all's work. Yeah, shout out Howman Forge. There you go on Facebook. Oh. I'm not on Facebook a bunch. I'm, well, I'm barely on Facebook. I post about live streams, upcoming work, completed projects from time to time, and that's mostly Jessica. Uh, I, do, I just, I lost my flavor for Facebook five years ago, I think. Yeah, I basically gave up Facebook um, for what it is. I, I do what I call now, I, 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 I scum around Facebook. So instead of skimming, or, or, or thumbing around, I, I scum around Facebook and just kind of see what everyone else is getting into, you know. Just making sure that, you know, it's still the cold, dark, heartless environment that I always knew it was. And it is. It's still there. <laughs> Roy rant. That's a miniature Roy rant. It's a mini rant. That should make, that would be a good series, wouldn't it? Just do a mini rant. Call them Roy rants. Yeah, it's like a Roy rant, but mini rant. Yeah. It's like last like 30 seconds. You know, for all the pea brain people that can't watch my videos for longer than 30 seconds. That way they get all the information they need. Blam, right there in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> I'm going to make all my haters really love me. Let's see, on the note of uh, scrap steel, a couple of people have talk, mentioned um, getting with mechanics for old leaf springs and coil springs. Mm -hmm. oh. 
Yeah, predominantly when I, when I speak about, unless you're very specific about a type of steel, I'm going to be more about the ornamental side of things. So uh, just keep that in mind. You know, if you ask me, I am not a, I'm not a knif maker. And uh, so I have no aspirations to be. Uh, but, you know, I do make my own tools. I do use scrap steel for the majority of everything. Um, but again, using scrap material, you're going to have to learn to work with scrap and treat each piece like it's its own special lady because you're going to have to treat each one, find out all of its little secrets and its quirks and all these other things uh, in, in your scrap bin. Um, just like Smiths of old had to do before we had standardization of steel. Um, that's where if you're doing something like you're do going to be doing tool making for a living or you're going to be doing uh, knif making for a living, you know, swords, things like that, uh, it's really beneficial for you to both start and find brand new steel uh, when you're ready to actually uh, start taking and making those items. That way you have a known heat treat method and st some steps you can follow that way uh, versus guesstimating everything and then have everything not work out. So, Still heating. I've got it, I've got the fire on low because I'm trying to avoid a lot of oxidization. I could, since this is running on coke, I could open it up and it would get to heat a lot quicker but I'm not wanting all the oxygen while I'm sitting here conversing with you, burning up my piece. There's a couple of people asking what I'm gonna do uh, in another enameling stream. Um, like I mentioned, I think last live stream, we don't have that scheduled just yet. But as much as we're staying at home, you never know. <laughs> we might just do like a random pop-up one at some point. Um, but I will try to do a video uh, sometime in the near future, maybe within the next three weeks or so. Uh, yeah, because it has been a little while. Yep. All right, you ready? Yep. Let's go over the anvil. Important thing is, are they all ready? All right, get this set up. I'm just taking incremental bites on this piece as I go up the way. I'm trying to keep it even on both sides of the bar stock so I come running down true. If you fuller too much on one edge, the bar will begin to bend and that's bad. You don't want it to bend um, too much out of order because then your lines get crooked. You want to hit it with about the same amount of force each and every time as you go. Now here's some of the stuff that, <clears throat> that if you're not paying attention, you'll miss. And, uh, this is where those comments come in a lot of times where somebody says, hey, you could have done this project in half the time if you weren't so wordy about it or if you wouldn't, wouldn't have explained things like you do or whatever. Um, this is the element that people miss. When I talk, I will tell you little secrets about everything I'm doing, why I'm holding the hammer a certain way, what I'm doing and looking for with the fuller, why I'm tilting it, little half face bites. Why? Why am I doing little half face bites on it uh, and going through here? Why am I fullering on both sides equally? Like those sort of things, it's really easy unless you're really, really paying attention to skip over those completely. Say, okay, yada, 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 all right, fuller that bar. Okay, yada, 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 scroll that bar. Okay, yada, 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 okay, that's done. Okay, just get it riveted together, right? And a lot of YouTube uh, education out there, that's done. Hopefully, can they see that all right? Does that look good on the camera? Can you see that fine there? Hopefully, they, hopefully they're liking the looks of that so far. I'm liking the looks of it. It's very even. Oh. I'm going to take one more cleanup heat on it 
and that's about as long as I'm going to do. I'm also going to go ahead and make sure the length. I'm going to go ahead and measure the length that I came back so that way I can make it equal on the other side. So that's about seven inches in length. So that's how long I want to make my other side of this scroll. The same amount of fullering, about seven inches in length. So. All right, I'll take one more little cleanup heat on that and then we can start scrolling that end. And I'm going to start scrolling the end because it will make it, if I start scrolling the end, it will make it easier for me to take and manage the whole bar stock. So, you know, it'll start getting, it'll be a little shorter, so it'll be a little bit easier to manage to fuller that other end. I won't have such a long four foot long bar to have to contend with. So I'll start scrolling that end up just to eat up some material and I'll start checking it to my design. And I'll start with the big end first. So that's what we're working on is the big end of this scroll first. Hopefully they can see that fine there in the thing. So we're going to be working on the big end, scrolling this bit up first to about halfway and then we'll finish out um, the rest. It probably won't be halfway, it'll probably be to about this point here where it would be riveted on. That's how far we're going to go with it. But like I was saying, I'll go ahead and this is a, since I've been paid for a rant, right? Yeah. Any questions before I get on that? Uh, yes, there is. Um, there's two different comments. It says, uh, G. Taylor, looks like you're hitting it cold, are you? Yes. Yes, I'm hitting it cold on that last heat. So I'm breaking it down. It's looking colder on camera because I've got, the IS, I've got the adjustments on the camera, um, so this way it's not just completely blown out when it's hot. And I also have a really strong light blaring right here at the anvil, so that's making it look even colder. Just like how hot steel look cold in sunlight, um, it's kind of the same effect. Uh, but I am hitting it down into the dark red heat in order to plainish up the grooves that I'm fullering in down both sides of the bar stock. Hopefully that makes sense. I, I'm, I'm using that heat, the last of the heat, to kind of clean up those grooves and uh, make any little plainishing moves in the center. So this way I'm taking out any little unevenness of the fullering. More questions? Okay. You're typing away over there. Yes. Any more super chats I need to acknowledge? Or, or we're fine. Okay, we're all caught up. If we didn't get to you, you can ask it again. <laughs> or say, hey, I super chatted earlier and I didn't get a reply. And we'll find you. <laughs> huh. So, um, yeah. So, YouTube is kind of a two edged sword. So, this would be a bit of a rant for me because I am, I, I consider myself an online educator, as well as I am a blacksmithing instructor. It's what I do. I go around, I teach classes at multiple different schools and things of that nature. So, you know, I do a lot of teaching. And I've always been one to take, if you ask me a question and if I know something about it, I'll try to give you the information. If I don't know something about it, I'll point you to somebody who I know who does know something about it, right? And that's always been kind of my MO. Well, when I started, when I started in blacksmithing, it was one of those that if an old guy had a story to tell you, you sat there if you cared to learn anything about blacksmithing, you sat there and you listened to it. If they demonstrated something before the days of YouTube online education here, if somebody was demonstrating something, you sat there for four hours and watched their demonstration if you cared to know the various things that they were teaching. And you had to go somewhere like a blacksmithing club that had a facility, or you had to go to a school, or you had to go somewhere, it, you know, there wasn't as much access as what we have now. So YouTube has really helped to not only get the word of blacksmithing out there, but also destroy the educational element. Um, because we are so used to saying, yeah, 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 I've seen scrolls before. Fast forward. Yeah, 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 I've seen people riveting stuff before. Fast forward because it's just right at the tip of your fingers, and I'm guilty of it too. I'm trying to find a very specific thing that I'm struggling with, and I have to challenge myself not to just scroll forward throughout a whole video, and then never find it, and then move on to another video, and then not find it, because I'm not finding it in the 
half a millisecond that I think the information should be pr presented. And it's one of those things that it's kind of tough to do and you have to challenge yourself not to do that. Um, because when I have a 20 minute long video, say it's around making tongs, I'm giving you specific advice for instruction and I always, it never fails, I'm inundated with questions that I covered in the video. Well, why about this? Or what about this? Or why not this? Or what don't you do here? I literally covered it in the video in detail and it just highlights how no one watched. <laughs> no one watched that section. It just shows that somebody jumped all the way through it. Um, and so that is the challenge if you really want to learn and understand blacksmithing in a technique, you have to hear a person fully all the way out. Sometimes you'll be like, oh, this guy's boring, or man, this isn't really my cup of tea. Or you move on to whatever else you want um, and to look. But the last thing I would want is to go to, say, like a class where I pay for my education and the teacher gives me 30 second sound bites out of a three day class. I get 30 seconds five times a day of information from him and not all the little intricacies and all the little details and what tools is he using and why, right? Like I'm there to learn. You got such a great resource online for educators that like me that put out, again, like on our channel, 1400 videos of content for free. A thousand of those are which are all tutorials. There is a good portion of those that only have 500 views on them. Think about that. There's a lot of information out there that you haven't even seen. So I get questions about, hey, what do you think about this? Or how do you do taper that? And I've got entire playlist sections a mile long that you could delve into that topic as deep and as wide as you want. And there's a lot of other education channels that do that too. Um, so if you want to support education and stuff and good free education online, like what YouTube can be, do the creators a big favor and stop pushing them to make shorter and shorter and shorter and more truncated content and not share those details. Because you, because, you know, like that saying goes, the devil's in the details. Well, so is the art. The art of blacksmithing is in those details. It's in the minutia. Um, and that's generally where you out there as a viewer are struggling with. That's why you're watching educational content in the first place and you're not watching fluffy kitten videos. You're trying to find out how to make a scroll or you're trying to find out how to forge a, a knif. You're trying to find out how to make a hammer. But then you get on a channel and the guy teaches you nothing about how to make a hammer. You're like, hey, look, I make a hammer. And he makes the hammer and there's no other information provided and you're left with just trying to glean little nuggets of information in between pop music and flashing strobe lights and all the other stuff to just try to gain your attention for, for 12 seconds on their video. So um, the more you send YouTube the proper signals, the better off the education content can be on the platform. So there's a Roy rant. There you go. A little mild, mildly done Roy rant. It's not Roy rant. It's really just wisdom. <laughs> you get what you want. If you want fluffy kitten videos, you will have your fluffy kitten videos. Well, just going to get better. Funded that with a student holler super chat that said Roy rant. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go back to the anvil, Jess. All right, we'll go ahead and brush this just to get the junk out of the groove and off the back side. I'm not really trying to remove scale. I'm just trying to remove the junk that collects inside here. And now I'm going to come in very lightly and I'm going to planish out these grooves. That little bit extra really does help. And as it cools down, you're probably going to have to hit it just a little harder. There.
There we go. So that's good there. That's been planished out. So now hopefully you can see that nice fullered look. Look good? Yeah. That straightened up a little bit. All right, I'm fairly happy with it. Look good there, sweetheart? Okay. Now for the scroll work. By the way, Chewy wants to know uh, what flavor of anvil you're using, Roy. And thank you for that super chat. What, what? Flavor of anvil. <laughs> what flavor? It is a petting hoss, a North German petting hoss anvil. 465 pounds. That's what flavor. <laughs> That's what flavor of the day it is. And thank you all for the super chats. We do greatly appreciate it. And thank you for changing the color of the sign so much. That one was from Arch5281. Uh, the orange one who says, love a Roy rant. <laughs> well, good. Well, good. It's almost time for a giveaway, huh? It is. Yeah, we're at 6.15. Yep, 6.15. Wow. Time is flying. Tonight. I am not getting anywhere close to getting this done, am I? Huh? Well, it's just iron work. I mean, I could have went for simple. I could go for super simple, but. Huh? Nah. You think I ought to keep going? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to start the scroll on this one, and then we'll go ahead and give away a few things just for those who have stuck around for an hour. How many people we got in the chat? Awesome. It's good to have that many people. Who care? Thank you for showing up. Thank you for setting your alarms. Like I said, you can always share it around with a friend, with a compadre, with a family member, with your children. Make them binge watch me. <laughs> you know, all that YouTuber stuff. <laughs> oh. You got to have like a five minute long spiel, you know, yeah. like. Comment, subscribe, don't forget to do these other 10 steps. And I could tell you what, our kids, if you set them down in front of TV, you don't exist. They just like, ah, uh, and it's like, hello, well, hey, life, food, huh, what? You know, they, their brain gets re-plugged in, so uh, it's, it's quite, quite humorous and a little bit scary. It's like, the house is on fire, and they're like, huh? Well, well, Snoopy's on, or whatever. Well, they don't even watch Snoopy anymore, so I'm old. I'll shut up. <laughs> All right, we ready? Let's go over to the anvil, and let's go ahead and start scrolling this. So tight to the anvil, first and foremost. We're going to start rolling this, and I'm also going to bump that little crack closed like I said I was going to do. So there we go. I'm using a wooden mallet because the wooden mallet will make it easier for me not to crush my detail. If I hit this with a hammer, I can be leaving flat spots all over this piece, and I don't want to have any flat spots on this piece. So, there we have it, that's starting to roll. Starting to look good. Roll. We'll keep rolling it. But before we do, I better check it to the pattern. Oh yeah, I got a long way to go, but it's getting there. I need to make that end a little tighter, so I'm gonna put that back in the forge there. So usually your pattern would be laying flat, and then you would check it to that flat pattern so you could look onto it and you're not having to hold this up weird like, you know, like this. I just have it set up against here so you can see. You can't see it if it's laying flat. At least not until we get camera number three, huh? Aimless Adventure asks, would this be in a scrolling gate uh, iron work section or just in general blacksmithing? Say that again. anywhere you'd want it. Um, you know, if you're talking about, this is considered 
This is kind of considered architectural smithing in a way, but it's more home decor type deal because this is for, if this was a much bigger sign, it could be considered architectural. This could be as easy as being a flower pot hanger and it's more home decor and it's not really architectural smithing at that point. Um, the classification just kind of de depends on what it is that you're doing. So this could be an element in a gate as well, all the scroll work. You can certainly put it in gates as well as just general blacksmithing projects that you have on hand, shelf brackets, you name it. So let's go to the anvil, Jess. It's getting hot. Got to tighten that up a little bit. Looking nicer. Good. You want to take your time with the start of this. and get it right to start with. You don't want to rush this portion of the process. You want to get it right to start with. Now that split did a little more than what I wanted it to, so I'll have to grip onto that with a pair of tongs and adjust that. But. Yeah, it's kind of weird that the rest of the bar didn't have that problem, but just right out there at that end, it got kind of thin. And must, that might have been the problem, is it got enough thinness to it that it had some brittleness right there. So let me adjust that. I'll grip through the piece and peel that end back up where it's supposed to be. Just where I can get that crack in line. There. That's not bad. That'll look decent. Once it's all scrolled up and hung about eight feet up in the air, you'll never notice it. <laughs> ah, the things I have to tell myself so I can sleep at night. All right. See, if you're really paying attention, you'll hear all the little jokes I put in there too. All my bad dad jokes. Yeah, so we roll that up a little bit more. When you are using the wooden mallet, can you use a rawhide, ma rawhide mallet as a alternative? Yep, yep. I would prefer a rawhide mallet, but my, sadly, my favorite rawhide mallet in the world finally gave up the gusto and uh, uh, that was about a year and a half ago, I think it was, or about two years ago. So ever since I've been using wooden mallets of various shapes and sizes, but a raw hide mallet's really nice because uh, it's super soft. I've never had a raw hide mallet ever mark or put a flat in anything, um, you know, so it's really nice for this type of work. So definitely raw hide mallet. Some people really dislike the way a raw hide mallet smells. Um, which is understandable because, you know, I mean, it is leather burning. So some people prefer the smell of wood instead, interacting with the hot steel. Manga12 ask what you called that tool again that you used to chase in the lines. Name of the tool? Oh, yeah, the, the name of the tool to chase it in the lines is just a fuller. It's just a quarter inch radius fuller. Nothing special to it. I've got a pair of tongs. I've got a whole kit. If you can see it in the background on the main cam, go back here. I've got a whole kit of a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of these that I made. Um, and I believe I even have a video of me building this thing, if you're interested in watching it on the online. But yeah, I made up, I think there's like 37 tools if memory serves me correctly, of handheld that all I've got to do is have one handle and then I make a bunch of little short stubby tooling and that way I can make a bunch of chasing work, kind of like what I'm doing here. All right, back to the anvil. So the scroll work here is literally all going to be about finesse. Your ability to get this right is just all on the eye. Now remember, take note, we measured and this section that I fullered was seven inches long. 
So I want you to take a look at how much material. Look at how much material is taken up in seven inches. Yep. We're almost there to the end, aren't we? Yeah. And that was seven inches of material. So it doesn't take long. We'll continue to roll that. That's looking good. Let me flip it around. Yep, I'm a little tight in that section. Eh, not quite. That's actually looking pretty good. I could cut, I could loosen it up just a bit. So we'll do that in the next heat. If you roll if you roll it too tight, it's kind of a pain. So again, that first starting section of that scroll, that very first tight end of the scroll, you got to get that right in order for the rest of the scroll to work out itself properly. So uh, take the time you need to make sure that that section is right. It has the right curvature and everything that you're looking for. Daniel Crawford asked what size rawhide mallet you like using. Uh, I believe it's like a two, um, probably a pound or two rawhide mallet. Um, I forget which the other one was. I mean, it had been wore back so much, so I don't know what it started as. I know it was really lightweight. It's a really lightweight, and it has a small face. And so it was really easy to get into all the little areas versus like this, this big mallet. It's a little more trying to hit. You have to work the corners of the mallet and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I like the smaller rawhide mallets, you know, within a pound and a half, two pounds right in there. All right, back to the anvil. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of bump that a little bit to stretch it back out ever so slightly because it doesn't need to be as tight as what it was rolling up. Again, this is kind of the boring part, but this is where it all happens. So. If you want beautiful ironwork, you want to take time on getting this just right at the beginning. So we'll go back to the main cam. We'll check this. The drawing. There we go. That's a much better roll on it. See? It's been fixed. So now I need to get my heat. Grab my finger pointer. Mr. Thing. Now I need to get my heat focused right in this area. I need to get a much longer heat so I can get this big, nice radius roll to start happening. That makes sense. Trust me, this right here, this fishtail, when it's done, it's, go it's gonna make the piece. You'll be glad you added some extra interest, visual interest to this piece. It changes the world of stuff where somebody might be like, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen iron work before. I, yeah, yeah, I've seen, I've seen some scroll work like that before. They got it down at the local Home Depot. And then they were like, whoa, whoa, wait a second, that's different. And what's different, you ask? Oh, there's some fuller lines. Well, I want some fuller lines in my ironwork. And they go to Home Depot. And Home Depot can't give them fuller lines in their ironwork. Well, what's the deal? I guess I'll have to look up a for real blacksmith to give me fuller lines in my railing that I'm looking to build. See? It's those little details that ends up getting you the job. <laughs> it is. It's those little details like that that a customer's eye will really draw a customer's eye right into and they'll be like, oh, man, I want that. I don't know what it is I like about that, but it's so much more pleasing than that weird flat thing that's on the end of a scroll that was done in a Kibo vendor. The Fencers Forge says, uh, poor Roy, I feel your pain about your tools. My makeshift anvil broke the other day. It wasn't a real anvil, but I still liked it. Boo. <laughs> that is sad. I am sorry that it broke the other day. But hopefully you can fix it. It is steel after all, hopefully. <laughs> you, should be able to put it, you should be able to put it right as rain. I would hope so. And thank you all for the super chats. Hopefully I haven't been ignoring too many. I want to make sure I acknowledge people. When I finish rolling this, I promise, we will give some stuff away. 
Okay? Yeah. All right. Ready to go to the anvil? All right. All right, we'll start pushing this into the radius I'm looking for. I'm going to check it against my design. I need to make sure that I constantly check this against the design that we're getting there. So it's good. So this way we don't have to unbend it. Sometimes <laughs> if you don't check it, you're like, oh, look, ain't that fun. And you start developing a scroll and you're like, yeah, that looks so nice. And then you check it to your design and you're like, oh, no, that didn't match at all. So, yeah, see, that's coming right on around. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Now we make the heat even longer. So to go back on a question real quick, can I go back on one earlier about Hans? Is Hans still here, by the way? Charming Hollow Forge, Hans, if you haven't checked Charming Hollow Forge out, you definitely should. He's a big supporter of this channel, as well as Yamez at Island Metal Forge. You really ought to go give those guys a like and a sub if you're here. Um, they support me on the regular um, and can't say thank you enough. Shipping items is quite expensive, and they have been supporting for a while on the regular, um, and especially Yamez and stuff. Really greatly appreciate it, brother, as you're trying to take and grow your own um, streaming and everything. Yamez streams, I believe it is every Saturday at 5 or 6 p.m., I believe it is. And then Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., Yamez is streaming. He's taken over for uh, Tim over at Big Dog Ford for the Sunday morning blacksmith church, if you will or that it has become dubbed and named as affectionately. So make sure you check them out, check Hans out. Again, he's doing some really neat stuff over on his channel. Um, they're definitely worth your time. You know, go check them out. Pretty interesting dudes. But again, thank you guys for being here. I did just want to mention Hans specifically in that for what I was getting to. Here's where this is not a perfect uh, golden ratio or golden rule spiral, right? Like, if you mathed it all out and mapped it and put your squares and did this all and put everything up there and you drew it out perfect, gridded everything, it would not take on life or character of its own. It would be very mechanical. It'd be very much exact of whatever, you know, you drew that out to be exactly. But then every single scroll you make would be exactly alike and exactly like that thing and uh, you should try it try it try it for yourself and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about some handmade scrolls when each one's a little bit different and they're not just absolutely perfect it really sells the piece um, that doesn't mean you want to do sloppy scroll work but it really sells the piece is a very nice pleasing to the eye uh, scroll that has been hand crafted and hand wrought over if you make a perfectly machined out scroll jig and then put every scroll you ever make across the three or four decades you work on doing blacksmithing for in that one scroll jig and that's all you ever use. So uh, just case in point on this. Sometimes that natural element really does help sell the work. All right, here we go. We're going to go to the anvil. Okay, so giving it more roll. I'm always checking it for correctness, making sure I'm not ending up with any weird flat spots. And I'm always trying to keep this moving while I'm tapping it. As you can see, this is just finesse work. So now we'll see how much how much I accomplished there. I do like to brush in between heats because you might come around and cover this area up and you can't get back to it. But you see how that looks? Okay, let's go back over to the thing here. I'm sorry, Jess, if this is a little action intensive, but. OK, 
Okay, good. I can tighten that up even more in that area. I was worried about that. We'll go back to the anvil. I was worried that I was tightening it up too close, but it wasn't. We'll go back to the main. Again, flat on a table is better. There we go. See? Right on, around, around we go. One of the other things that you can do, by the way, to this, which I'm still debating on whether I want to do it or not, you don't have to come to a perfect determinant end. Hopefully you can see this. Let's go down to the anvil. I think that's a better look for it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's better. Okay. You don't have to come down to a determinant end. You can actually make this curl out if you want. So like you can make this more flowing into where it's not all just directly in line like it is here. You can make this flow out and then kind of spiral, spiral up if you will out of the frame. And that can look nice as long as the other end of the scroll, the other end of the scroll goes the opposite direction to keep your flow of line through the piece. That's something else that you can do. You don't always have to make the scroll end up exactly in the dead center of everything. Scrolls are but to take and imitate the organic nature that you can do, right? A scroll is meant to look very organic and whimsical. So you can make it look a little bit better. You do want to adhere to this nice spiraling principle with no flat spots. That's your aim when making scroll work, is not to have any flat spots. And I'll put one last little caveat to that. By the way, we're taking longer and longer heats now. One cave caveat, and I think that's the proper terminology. I've been using that word a lot, so I better look it up probably in a dictionary. Um, I think I did at one time, and I think I'm using the word incorrectly. Uh, one caveat to that is, so say you were making, uh, you were called upon to make something for like a Dr. Seuss fan or book, then you want to do very geometric scrolls, like with squares um, or hexagonal or some of those type things. You want to take and use a lot of facets in your work and crooked things that kind of just jerk and go wherever at weird angles and intersections. And it's going to look really nasty piece by piece, but once the whole picture comes together, it looks very... Um, dystopian looking, or it looks very much like a Dr. Seuss novel or, or something of that nature. Um, yeah, just, just a word to the vice. So not every scroll ever made has to be perfectly a spiral that is perfectly radiused into the center. Um, but that's the key though, but it has to fit the entire, s <laughs> it has to fit the entire piece. So if you're making one square scroll, you better make another square scroll <laughs> to match and another one 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 and, and, and don't stop because if you start adding round scrolls into a bunch of square scroll areas, it's gonna look bad real quick. What's going on, girl? Yamas, thank you for the super chat. Again, his super sticker um, is a mustache and it turned it red. That was a couple back. And then he sent the $5 one that turned it green. He says, thank you so much, Roy. Love you, brother, for um, you, brother. mentioning his channel. And also the Fencer Fencers Forge also sent a green super chat who said, I'm absolutely trying to support you any way I can. Both of you, thumbs up. Love everything you do. Appreciate that, Fencers Forge. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I promise after we get this scroll done, we will give some stuff away too. Um, just to thank you all for being here. And since there's less people, you guys have higher odds of winning. Ain't that work? How's that work? Yeah, it's quite funny. Everyone and their brother and their cousin and their uncle and their aunt has decided to become a YouTuber. So I think that's why we have lower attendance. You know, everyone and their brother I've seen like, a god-awful amount of live streams, a god-awful amount of content being produced in just the last couple weeks because everyone's sitting at home and like, well, what do we do now, George? Like, well, I guess we'll become a big, grand YouTuber. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's what I've seen here, seen here as of late. Um, I find it 
I find it kind of comical because it's going to be interesting once all of this uh, weirdness in the world is over with how many of those people stick around and continue uh, their little trail of providing you value and content. That, that's going to be, that'll be the interesting one to see who hangs around and who makes a stick of it. So, because YouTube is a volatile place. Also, thank you, Granddad's Forge, for the $10 super chat. Is a pair saying thank you. <laughs> thank you, Granddad's Forge. Really appreciate you. And when I say that, I know that might sound like a standard line from me. Um, it's just I don't know what else to say other than I do. I really do appreciate you all out there, and I hope you all know, you know my heart and soul on that, that I do. I, I super appreciate each and every last one of you. Even if you weren't super chatting, I'm very thankful for you showing up. I'm thankful for you sharing the content. I'm thankful for, for you all that are always in my videos comments. It's like you, you smell when one of my videos is about to go live and you're there before it even starts playing 20 seconds in. And uh, that is huge to me and I greatly appreciate it. I really, really do. There's not much else I can do about it there. The giveaways and stuff is just one small part of that is just trying to re-put some of that out there. And your all support has been overwhelming and we do appreciate it. So ready to go to the anvil? Let's do this real quick. All right, so now bigger. I have to watch it. I'm gonna to wanna to go check it real quick. Go over to the thing. Ah, see where I'm at. Very nice, need to curl it some more. One quick tip for beginners in making scrolls or scroll work or designing scroll work. Remember, it's always easier to draw the scroll than it is to make the scroll. So, be advised. <laughs> be advised on that. I know sometimes it looks like it's really easy, but, uh, or people make it look easy. But I've done it too to myself where I've drawn something, I've drawn out something really elaborate and then I get into it and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like 50 foot of stock and I don't have 50 foot of stock sitting on my shelf. Um, or, you know, it's to the point that I've made it hilariously time intensive and then I'm like, oh, why did I do this to myself when I could have made it a little easier or a little simpler pattern. So. Um, just kind of keep that in mind when you're just getting started into designing your scroll work. You may want to go hog wild and add a whole bunch of curly cues and all that other stuff, but remember that all eats up linear inches of material and you will have to deal with the logistics of making that scroll work work. So you can see how long it's took me to make just this one end to get going here to match our drawing. If I wasn't working to a plan or a pattern, this would be quicker. I would just scroll it up to whatever I thought looked good and call it a day at that, and then that's what I would add. But since I've made myself a drawing, I'm trying to strictly adhere to the drawing itself. Frank Strzok says, you're awesome, Roy. I've been following you for a long time now and meeting you in person a couple of times in 2018 made my day. Thank you, Frank. You're awesome too, pal, and it has been a pleasure to know you and for you to be on the channel. You've been a longtime supporter of ours. Thank you for being here and continuing to support us. Also, thank you, Neil Graham, for the $2 super chat. He says, keep being yourself. Will do. All right, we ready? Let's go.
All right, go check that out. Right on around we go. It's getting there. We're real close to that last bend. Can you see that? Getting real close to that last bend. Right on around we go. So as I'm putting this thing back in the fire, I'm taking longer and longer heats. So I'm spreading out, I'm spreading out the bed of coke lengthways in the fire. Um, that way I'm heating up a portion of the part that's already been scrolled. And then I'm putting the main portion of my heat into the area that needs to be scrolled. So it's a gradient, it's a gradient of heat to the scroll that you just started to where you're going. Um, where you're going is the hottest and it's gradienting to where you came from, which is still needs to be somewhat hot so it transitions nicely and you don't end up with a cold, uh, with a, a, uh, a right angle in there, a bend, a kink. You don't want to have any kinks in it. Someone asked if you ever change your design halfway through the project. Yep. Rapid design changes. Those are a part of life. <laughs> um, usually, usually not. If I've designed something and I've sold it specifically, if I design something and I sold it, I'm going to do it, better believe me, I'm going to do it to exactly the exact standard that I designed it and sold it. So, um, because again, you won't want to take and go to Walmart or order something online. That's a better example. You won't want to go ahead and order a pair of Vice grips online and somebody se sends you a pair of needle nose pliers, right? Like, so you ask for Vice grips, you get Vice grips, you expect them to have all the colors and qualities and all the things thereof and do the job like they're supposed to. Same way with custom iron work. Um, if you sell it to be a specific size, you need to maintain as tight a tolerances as you can within reason. Uh, certain things won't matter. If it was like on this arm here, they're like, oh, it's got to be, you know, I want it to be at least 24 inches long. Well, that means at least 24 inches long. So that means you could have some little scrolly in detail that maybe sticks out past 24 inches long. But say if this is a fireplace crane, this is a swinging fireplace crane, and they need the pot that they're hanging from it to swing exactly dead center of a fireplace. Now you're more locked into, you have to have the hook on the end to the exact length of what that fireplace is. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Um, Tyson says, why does the sign have blue? I thought Roy hated blue anvils. <laughs> nope, don't hate blue anvils. I just don't particularly like the color of blue on an anvil. That's not my favorite. I'm, I, I guess I, I guess I'm more old school. I just like, I just like an anvil that's black or gray. You know what I mean? Just black and gray. I, I, I like the, that look of an anvil versus having them all painted up into just different colors and whatnot. And then the paint always smokes off and it gets in your lungs and it's, it's just not a good time. All right, ready? All right. Develop just a little bit of a flat spot there. So I'm gonna start I'm just tapping it midair, and that tapping midair will help it uncoil a bit. So, versus creating more flat spots. Again, I'm brushing. The reason why I'm brushing is because if I don't brush now, I might cover it up with other scroll work. So, we'll go check that out. I'm going to say that's pretty darn close. Now we're up to the point where we would forge weld on the other piece. 
I'm going to take it just a little bit further. One last little heat here. And we're going to call that side good. We'll go on to the other. But before we do that, we'll go ahead and give away a bunch of stuff. That way, if anybody needs to take off and go somewhere or we decide we don't want to complete it this evening, which would be a travesty. But you guys will get the point. Basically, I'm doing this to all the pieces. All the pieces. Then they will be scarfed, prepped, put together, uh, pinned. We'll go into that in the next video. Um, and then forge welded. So that's a special little fun trick of forge welding scrolls together. So takes a little bit of ingenuity. Go ahead. Thank you, Yamez, for the super sticker. His uh, smiley face with dollar signs in his eyes. And also that was followed up with Aimless Adventure Super Chat that says side blast or bottom blast solid fuel forge, question mark. That is a good debate. First of all, thank you gentlemen, again for the super chats. Um, side blast versus bottom blast, I would say coke, side blast. Uh, coal, bottom blast. There you go. That would, be my, that would be my suggestion on it. Since I'm converting to coke when I build my big brick hearth, um, I have some plans in the works to make both a bottom blast and a side blast. So it'll, it'll be set up to where I can do either or based upon what I'm doing. Um, you know, I'll put a plate in it, in the bottom of it, in the fire pot itself for the bottom blast section when it's not in use. And I'm just using the side blast for coke. But most likely what I'm going to be burning in my shop from here on out is just going to be coke. So I'm going to be hovering towards the uh, side blast myself. Reason for that being is coke has a real tendency to just pack down in a bottom blast forge and it's harder to get the oxygen up through, in my opinion. At least that's been my experience with it. So, are we ready? Go to the anvil. How's that look? Good. Oh, we're right in there. We're so close. Back over the anvil. Just went over the horn real quick to get that extra little bit. Go back over to the design. go yeah one more little heat in there and that'll have it rolling right on around one more little heat looking good and we're gonna call that it on that side for right now um, I've got it rolled up enough that it's gonna be a lot handier to go ahead and, and do the other end so Now's the time to go ahead and quit messing with that side. We'll let that cool down. And uh, then I'll go ahead and quench it off the rest of the way. Set that off to one side. By the way, it's also very advantageous if you're doing this for a job or for your own project is to do all of your foolering work all at once. So you do all your ends all at once. Get all your foolering done, then do all of your scrolling and then do your attaching and so on and so forth. So do it in process. Um, I'm trying to get you the example of everything that we're doing here because it's just more of the same. I'm gonna be creating some more of the scrolls and then they're all gonna get placed together. Uh, when I get these done, uh, when I get all the scrolls done, if we don't do them, we probably won't get to all of them tonight. When I get all the scrolls done, I will go ahead and put up a picture on Instagram of the current progress of where we're sitting. So if you haven't followed me over on Instagram, you should. I put a lot of behind the scenes type stuff over there and you know, also alert people when we go live and other things. So definitely worth your time. 
All right. Are you ready, my love? Let's kick this thing off with a tong, huh? Okay. How many people we got in the chat? Woohoo! That's a lot of people. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Not as many as the anvil. But to be fair, there's about 100 of them drop off like flies, huh? Yeah. As soon as the anvil's given away. <laughs> so, all right, I'll just hold it up here. That's fine. Oh, we're going to give away a pair of bolt jaw tongs. These are made by Kins Custom Iron. They were supplied to me uh, by Couch Forge Company, correct? Yes? Yep. yep, by Couch Forge Company. Thank you so much uh, for supplying these tongs. Not only these, but a lot more. So uh, there's going to be, these are going to be a regular occurrence here in the live stream. So thank you, thank you, sir, uh, for sending these to us and supporting us in that way. And thank you to all the super chatters that really help out with the shipping of these things. Um, I can't tell you that that does get quite expensive. So all door prizes are available to anybody in the United States and around the globe. So it doesn't matter where you're at in the world, you are eligible to win as long as you're over the age of 18. And you know all that jazz, you have to contact us with the contact link down in the description down below. With that, all that out of the way, let's go ahead and draw for it, huh? I'm going to use the mallet this time to ring the anvil, huh? Ready? <laughs> and who? Ah, right. We landed on Alan Murdoch, who says free stuff. Alan Murdoch. Yes, sir. Free stuff. Get with us with your contact information, how to, you know, the shipping address and things like that. You can find all that information in the description. I guess I should have said, but people been here long enough. When we do this, this is the drum roll, and then you comment in the comment section. <laughs> I should have said that, huh? I dropped it in the comments, like I let them know. Oh, oh, you let them know? Okay, because I didn't. I'm horrible. Anyways, so those are for the bolt gel tongs. Okay. Congratulations. And by the way, these get shipped out with rivets, by the way. I'll send rivets with them. Did I send rivets with the other ones? I packaged them in, yes. Oh, see? Guys. I had to go dig around through your shelf, though, to find them. Self a good woman, and you have found yourself, you know, a treasure for life. There you go. Wink. <laughs> All right, so the next pair of tongs are these kind of, uh, what are, I believe are meant to be scrolling tongs. So uh, they got really short nibs on them so you can draw them out into a really nice fine taper and then you'll have to draw the handles out quite a bit um, for that but also provided again by Couch Forge Company and thank you for doing that. So we'll be sending these out and they'll have a rivet with them as well. And so let's go ahead and draw. Wait a minute, how many people are commenting? A lot of people? Um, it slowed down a little so their odds are higher. Yeah, their odds is higher? Good. All right, here we go. <laughs> I almost forgot to stop ringing the amp. Oh, yeah, you gotta stop. This one is going to Joseph Mascari. It says, pick me. Hey, cool. Joe, congratulations. Congratulations. I've picked you. Now all I gotta do is get with us with the contact information down in the description. All right. Let's go ahead and give away a couple more things, huh? Yeah, sure. While we're here. I do it. We're kind of doing it all at the end today. I was a little unprepared. I should have been a little better prepared, but having the audio issues that we had to start with has kind of it threw me off kilter. So you'll have to forgive me for that, hopefully. So next, we're going to give away some of your um, everyday photography for blacksmiths ebooks. Um, so we've got two of these, two vouchers for that, and we'll be giving away one each. And uh, you can redeem these at www blacksmithpdfs.com, um, valid until May 15th, 2020. So, and this is for everyday photography for blacksmiths ebook. And I'll let Jessica explain a little bit about that. Yes, that is the ebook I finished writing uh, t February. I believe it was in February. Um, and uh, I think it's about 40 to 50 pages, somewhere in that range. And it covers uh, everything that you need to know for the basics for photography. 
Uh, it goes over kind of like you're like setting the scene. Uh, it also goes over some of the additionals with, um, <laughs> it goes over some of the additionals uh, like photo editing and then some recommended cameras. But again, you don't have to have a fancy camera to start with and you can still um, gain value from the ebook just starting with what you have. So, um, yep, we're gonna give away two of those ebooks and uh, when you reply with your email address, it will just be, it'll just all email it directly to you. You don't have to wait to receive the certificate. Are we ready? All right, we'll be giving away one of them now. And go. All right, we landed on Kayla Clark, who says, please, two exclamations. Well, there you go. Congratulations. You won, please. <laughs> two exclamations. Can't forget the exclamations. Let's go ahead and give the other one away real quick. Now, this is like, a, are their fingers wearing out yet? I think so, a little bit, yeah. Yeah? yeah. They're slowing down? Uh, no interest? Yeah. I, I don't know if it's freezing or if it's slowing down. Yeah. Just put this away? <laughs> oh, no. No, no, they want it. No, they want it? Okay. All right, here we go. All right, this one is going to uh, Eve Maggiore, who says me. Eve Maggiore? Sure. Well, congratulations, Eve. You win. <laughs> That's pretty simple, huh? Yep. All right, just like usual. Let's go ahead and give away a few sticker packs, huh? Right. This is weird. This is like weird doing it this way. It's like yeah. bulk giveaway thing. So, all right, so this has our year of the anvil for only this year only for 2020. And it has several of our other decals provided to us by Dana Maggiore. Thank you, sir, so much for providing these to us so we can do these giveaways with them and uh, get you all some cool sticker packs. So that's what you're going to be winning. We're going to give a few of these away, huh? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Straw, if you want some stickers, start dropping a chat. And go. Got to turn me on. Uh, Dave, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> Just jumped away. Okay. David Evans said comments. Comments, David Evans. Congratulations. Get with us and we'll send these out to you. Let's go ahead and draw another one. Okay. Speed round. All right, this one is for Tommy Wright, who says me. Hey, Tommy Wright, congratulations. Good to see you, brother. There you go. All right, and the last one, ready? It is. Are you okay? Can you handle this? Can they handle this? We're just gonna keep it going. We're gonna crash you two. They be like, "Hey, what's happening on over here?" All right. This time I landed on XG-000. Who says me? XG-000. Congratulations. Get with us, and we will send these out to you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit of upset work, a little bit of fuller work on this end, and we'll start the, we'll start the fishtail scroll on this end, and then we'll give away the last little bits, which I've got a punch and a chisel, and, and a small pair of copper tongs provided to us by Drayson's Forge. So, so thank you, thank you. All right, we'll get this good and hot. Hopefully they're all enjoying the content. Let me know if you're enjoying the content or if you have questions, Jess, if there's questions in the comment section. We'll get this hot. Yeah, as, as far as I can tell, there wasn't any questions in there unless somebody like just happened to wonder in the, the chat and they're like, whoa, it's going crazy. What's happening in here? Um. <laughs> I, I liked Brett Larson's comment there, fangirl screams and blacksmith. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh. Also, the sign has changed since last time I looked back at it. Oh, Have we... Those super 
that was Yamez. I said, Yamez, I think this chat was, it's when he super chats a super sticker. Well, sorry. When it's a super sticker, it goes to red for only for him. Anybody else it's done normally. Um, but then just a regular super chat, it does blue like it's supposed to. So he's, he's pretty excited about that to have it back to being able to change it to blue. Well, Yamez, <coughs> excuse me. Yamez is a very special individual, so. Thank you, Yamez, thank you. <laughs> Jeremy Harrison says, content is great, just sitting back and taking it in. Thanks for everything. Very welcome. Let me also get a time check, Jess, where I know I'm at here. Uh, we are at 7.04. And a question for you, uh, Gary Mettler asks, content is great, do you use nut coal? Uh, nope, I'm using coke. Um, it is a metallurgical grade coke in my forge. So, yep, I'm glad you're enjoying the content. You're almost there. Okay. Next one. Junior D asks, how long you have been forging? I don't know. How long have I been forging, Jessica, now? She's my analytical person, so. Uh, 12 years, approximately. <laughs> yeah, 12 years, approximately. 12 years, yep. It's weird because there's a certain amount of time that I truly started forging and picking up the craft, and there's a certain amount of time I kind of just diddled with it once a month for, you know what I mean, or maybe every other weekend or something like that. Um, but I wasn't able to pursue it very well. And then there's a certain amount of time that I started and I, I've been a professional blacksmith for. I've been a professional blacksmith for about eight years, coming up on about eight years now, so. And, those, and yes, there's a big difference in all of those. All right, back to the anvil. Okay, okay just like before. Go ahead and knock up this end here. Go ahead and get it a little upset, get a little mass into it. Want to keep it straight. But you do want to push back that mass of that bar and get it to thicken up. Want to keep it in line. We have to end up getting this. Uh, I'll get one more heat on that. You want to keep your heats as short as possible to make your time doing this as pleasant as possible. Long heats and upsets don't mix. So when you go back to main cam, really long heats and upsets don't mix. You want to have really nice short heats to compress that material and then keep taking incremental heats as you need the upset to progress. Uh, when you're doing it by hand like this. If you've got like some big 100 ton press and you're just trying to squish a column like this, you'll notice that the first thing they want to do once they start resisting is buckle. So the whole piece is all heated up. You have a lot better, you have a lot better odds of compressing all that mass if you just heat one end, heat the other end, and then heat the entire piece and then continue to squish. Um, you have a lot better odds of compressing the whole thing nicely there's a certain ratio to the length slash diameter that you can go um, when it comes to that. And that basically works when you're doing it by hand as well, um, mostly. But, I mean, we're not perfect. We're striking at all different weird angles and sometimes harder, sometimes lighter. So go back to the anvil. So here I'm not trying to forge this back out when I come to the anvil. All I'm doing is taking the bend out of it. So as soon as it hits the anvil surface, I stop whaling on it. I just want to get this straightened back up. You'll see it bend, put it the mountain peak up, other mountain peak up, and stop hitting it once it hits the anvil surface. And that's how you can flatten the piece back out. 
All right, so that's got enough mass into the end of the bar now for my liking. I could be pretty happy with that. It doesn't need to be straightened up a fuzz. All right, good to go. Now the next heat, we'll go ahead and fuller that out a little bit and then run our fullers in there. So Creek Forge, thank you for the $2 super chat. It says thank you for everything. And also the Fencers Forge sent a super chat. It says sadly, I have to say good night. I'll absolutely see you on the next live stream. Keep doing what you do and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Most definitely. See you on the next live stream. And thank you for being here and all the support. Uh, James Ray's ask if you'll be doing any more tong videos. Um, right now, I've got one tong video or one left or no, we've already done them all. Okay, yeah, so I've got a video on the um, bending wrench or the little uh, scrolling forks that RX Tong sent with the tongs to try out. They've also offered for me to take and do some more of their tongs. So uh, if, if you have that interest, go back to one of the RX Tongs videos on the series and comment what style of their tongs you would like to see next. And I wouldn't mind making videos about that. Um, I do have a plan on making a little review video of Ken's custom iron tongs because they're, again, it's the, kind of, it's the same thing. It's a cut out, a pre cut out tong blank. He has a different offering style set than what RX tongs does and uh, vice versa. So, so I'm interested in playing around with those and doing like a how to on those type tongs. Um, but I know RX Tongs has a bunch more different types of tongs that they offer. So if you're interested in some of them, drop it in the comment section. Um, I believe Rex was on there. Rex or Ed Appleby was on there. And you should be able to comment under one of their comments what you would be interested in seeing next. And maybe they would send some of those over and we could check some more out that way. But yeah, I do plan on doing some more tong videos uh, in the future with those at some point. I have an entire playlist, a big playlist of tongs, so definitely go check them out. All right, go back to the anvil. All right, cross beam. We're gonna fuller out this material just a little bit, just like we did before. We're not looking for thin, we're just looking for spreading somewhat wide. And like I said before, the fuller when I come in with the fuller, that's going to spread it out that extra little bit. So that's why we don't need to thin this too much. And that might have been my problem in the other one, is I might have thinned the end just a little too much and it couldn't handle the fullering. There you have it. Get this good and hot. Uh, Daniel Gray asks, have you always used a coal forge or do you just prefer it over gas or propane? Um, ever since I started my blacksmithing journey, I started my blacksmithing journey in this forge, in this coal forge. Jessica picked it up for me at a garage sale when I was first aspiring to be a blacksmith. Um, and it just seems right to use it ever since. So um, I will retire the old girl here. Um, not Jessica, the forge. <laughs> I got to make that statement. <laughs> um, I will, however, be retiring the forge um, soon just because it needs some maintenance to it. Uh, some of the sidewalls, the tin on the body has been rusted out. I need to redo that. Um, and that requires some rivet work and some other stuff. I plan on eventually doing a rehab of it 100% and then just keeping it as a uh, kind of setting it up for a bit of a portable rig. It's not all too portable. The forge isn't right now as it sits, but that's where I'm kind of going with it is I might set it up to do some sort of a little bit of a portable rig with this where I can just kind of float around the shop or be outside or whatever when I need it. Um, but the main plan is to take and have a big stone hearth over here. Um, that's I am currently collecting stone for. So if you know of any places in northern Michigan, around the Harrisville, Michigan area, or 
in Alcona County in Michigan. Uh, send them my way if they've got stone. <laughs> stone and mortar, that's what I need, stone and mortar. Um, but yeah, no, I've got gas forges too. I've had many different shapes and sizes, haven't I, Jess, over the years of gas forges and coal forges too. I've done them all, so. Uh, but if I have a preference, because that will probably be the next likely question, um, my preference is coal. Coal forges, coke forges. Um, I don't know, might be nostalgic, but I think that they're highly versatile. They're super cheap to run comparatively to gas if you live around coal country or a place that you can get coal or coke. Um, they are way cheaper than uh, propane and you have the ability to get really tight heats on stuff and it's just nicer. Nicer work, nicer finish work. All right, we're ready to go to the anvil when, you're, when we got a second, but I'll take in another question real quick. Or, this one is from the Fencers Forge. He says, last one, LOL. He's also the green super chat. Good night to everyone. And this one is to help with shipping. Just want to help in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. It will definitely help with shipping. All right, we ready? Let's see here, let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yep, gotta make sure I'm putting the fullers on the correct side. All right, out to the anvil we go. Just like before, I'm gonna start off at the edge. I'm gonna track the edge right on around. I'll put the fuller right on the edge and then work the piece back to center. Go to the other side, right on the edge. And work the piece back to center. I'll take another heat on that. This time I won't work it too cold like I'm doing right now and hopefully it won't split out. Pull that out. Hopefully you guys can see the start of that there. I don't know if I properly showed that last time but that's the start of the piece there. It's starting to get, get that really nice fan there. We do have to bring this back with the fuller a bit more. Um, here to get it lined up with the other one and then right on down the piece we go for seven inches. here. Um, Doe Creek Forge, thank you for the $2 super chat. He says thank you to all the vets out there. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the super chat and yes, thank you to the vets out there. Uh, James Ray says he needs a new fire pot. Any ideas on who has the best? Ooh, good question. Um, I know there's several out there. I know you can get some on Blacksmith Depot, I believe. You get some fire pots there. I know Sofa has a Sofa pot that they sell or that they had had selling for a while. Um, that's a really good fire pot. I like those. Those are really high quality castings and things. Um, so I can vouch for those. Um, yeah, other than that, I'm not really sure. There's a lot of kind of fabricated ones that are just solid steel fabricated pots. And uh, I mean, they'll, they'll mostly work. They'll, they'll work for a good long time as long as you're not, you know, burning your fire hollow all the time. If you keep the coke stocked up and burning up where you're supposed to be, uh, those work out really well. Yeah, that would be my recommendation there. You can do a Google search. As long as it's a cast iron one, it should be okay. Um, read a lot of reviews and see if you can't find anything on it. Eventually, I hope to do a lot of reviews on different forges and things of all sorts that you see around the internet and uh, all sorts of blacksmithing tooling. But that it takes an extreme amount of money to review tools like that. So uh, a lot more than what my small channel will handle with, uh, <laughs> with, with YouTube's current <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know, stifling, I don't know what you'd call it. Uh, their, their current uh, non, 
non-promotingness of educational content. So, yeah, oppressing. That's probably good. All right, go to the handful. <laughs> Leave it to Jessica to tell it like it is. The oppressive YouTuber. The oppressive YouTubes. They're just happy little blacksmith people trying to teach blacksmithing. They're like, we don't want that here. Blacksmiths don't go around here. Some people will get that reference. Hint, it's a movie. There we go. Now we're gonna now we're on to the fun stage. Now I got that edge all cleaned up. So you guys can see that nice swell there in the center. I think it looks really pleasing to the eye. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah. And now we're ready to go ahead and go right on back up the piece. Roughly about seven inches. All right, keep them company for a second, Jess. I want to go check on something. I'll be right back. All right, I guess that means I have to unmute my mic in order to keep you guys company. Um, let's see here. Toby Joe, thank you for the super chat. Um, let's see, yeah, yellow. Still wishing to start my vets group, but I'm grounded in the Philippines. Keep safe, everyone. God bless us all. Yeah, thank you for the super chat. Um, yeah, I remember you had asked us about the vets group and using our videos and stuff. Maybe even though you're grounded, maybe you can still do some brainstorming for that. Um, like maybe figure out which videos you want to do or what order that you want to do them in. And uh, if you're going to start a like a group of some sort, like Facebook or something like that, uh, you could always come up, start coming up with a banner. And there's, you know, there's still some other things you can do on that end. Uh, Hannah Man Ironworks, have a great night. Look forward to seeing you on the next one. Uh, Arch 5281, 20 past midnight here. Yep, hope you have a good night as well. Yeah, we're starting to get, getting a little later. Yeah, here in uh, Michigan, we are sitting at 721 p.m. Let's see, Oddwood Forge, hope you have a good night as well. And um, like Roy said, for those of you who still have a few more minutes you can spare, we still have a few giveaway items to do. Uh, we have the copper tongs, um, the little miniature ones. Those were made by uh, Drayson's Forge. Also a slitting chisel and a punch as well. So we hope that, um, we, yeah, we still got a few people sticking in here. Looks like about 95. <laughs> David Evans, we are glad that you enjoy our channel. Uh, yeah, we right now our current posting schedule is something along the lines of uh, three videos a week and then a live stream twice a month. So uh, I do have the next live stream posted down in the description below as far as the time, the date, and the link for that. So if you uh, want to set yourself a reminder there, but also like on your calendar or something, you can do that and know when that'll be. And uh, there's like a placeholder there, so you act, you can actually click on the link. I don't think it'll let you comment until like within 30 minutes of actually going live, but that is there for you. Uh, like Roy likes to say, I'm I'm the analytical one. I like organizing stuff, things like that. Uh, Kid KV says, can you use home heating coal for forging, Roy? Hmm. Can you use home heating coal for forging? Um. For general forging purposes, yes. For forge welding and things like that, you're going to have a terrible time. Um, home heating coal or hard coal as it's known is not very conducive for forging work. And I'll say good forging work, although I might get strung up in the comment section um, for that, but the fact is, is you can use it. I'm missing my glove. There it is. Whoop. Use my head. 
lose my head if it wasn't attached. Um, a good blacksmithing fire is an oxygen neutral fire. It's an oxygen neutral environment. So you burn up all of the oxygen in the oxygen layer of the fire, or the oxidizing layer of the fire. You have this neutral layer, and then you have, again, coke stacked on top of that neutral layer that is then burning, and it's consuming the oxygen on that end of the fire, and then your piece goes in the center. It keeps your piece cleaner. It makes your, makes your metal last longer. It's not going to, um, you know, doing it like that will allow you to have it, it will allow it to be less oxidized, less crummy looking when you pull it out of the fire. Um, and uh, you know, you'll have a lot less surface pitting and things like that in your final result and piece. The problem with home heating coal uh, is that when it, like anthracite for example, anthracite does not have enough surface area once it has been burning. It basically turns from anthracite to uh, you know a hard from that hard cold, which is basically pure carbon, and it basically burns up to nothing, to ash or whatever. Um, it's just a nugget, but it has no porousness to it. It has no surface area like the coke that you get from a green coal fire that is a soft coal where it will coke up, and so therefore not as good of a heating source. Now it puts off plenty of heat. That's not the problem. The problem is, is what, to get plenty of heat, you have to put in plenty of oxygen and that ends up affecting your work. So um, in my opinion, home heating coal is not a perfect solution. If that is what you have in your area and it gets you to start blacksmithing and do your thing, go right ahead. It's what you can do. You know, It might be all that you have in your area and by all means, go ahead and smith with it. Uh, it's just a lot more temperamental to get right. And as I said before, the reason why I am against it is for the amount of oxygen it puts onto your piece. So, uh, and it is not heat that burns steel like most people think. It is oxygen that burns steel. It is the combination of the two. You can't burn steel with just oxygen and you can't burn steel with just heat. It's not how it works. It's bringing the material up to a high temperature and then exposing it to oxygen is what burns your material. So again, if you use that logic or what's not logic, it's just a fact. If you use that fact and then you look at home heating coal and how much air that you have to throw into it in order to get it to burn correctly or get it to welding heat fires, um, it's not, it won't be your fuel of choice. Um, you'll end up burning a lot more stuff up than you get sticking or welding or forging. But general forging where you just need to heat something up and bend it, yeah, it can work fine for that perfectly. Ready? And Daniel Crawford asked if you know anything about lignite coal. Say that again? Lignite coal. Lignite coal. Yes, I believe that's like a brown coal. Lignite coal. That is one step shy of bimutamous coal, lignit coal is, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly. So in coal country, it's called brown coal, or it's what's closer to the surface of the earth. And usually there's a lot more trash and debris in it, and it puts out a fairly low amount of BTUs per ton. So it's not usually used a whole lot but you could smith in it just as well, and you might have a varying result. Got to make sure these lines are running true. I am hammering a little cold here because I'm trying to really get a good striking impression in here on this piece. Okay, now we're at that P part where those things are lined up. I'm give that a little bit of a bend back. Don't want to hammer on that too much. Can you see that all right? There you go. It's going to look so nice once it's all done. Scroll. Questions, Jess? Did that answer them? 
Good, good. Rob Ho at Huff, sorry, Rob Huff, says, curious if Roy has gone back and watched some of his old videos. I dare say with age, he's getting a little softer in his rants. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob Huff, um, you are right, good sir, on the softer in the rants, mainly because as I'm getting into my old age here on YouTube, I have realized that when you're online, people listen to about every fifth word you say. So I can put a whole diatribe, I can, I can write out a full out sonnet of exactly my belief on something. No mysterious, no smoke and mirrors. You know exactly where I stand on something at, at that particular time in my life. And people will read into it every fifth or tenth word they'll pick up and make their a judgment call based upon whatever that is. And so when it comes down to my rants, I'm a lot less stiff because my explanation doesn't come through. It's just the contrary nature of whatever I said. So whatever the thumbnail was is like, stop doing this. And everybody clicks on the video because they want to know why they should stop doing whatever it is that I've got on the thumbnail. And then that is the hot button topic and they make up their opinion of agree or disagree just based upon that little tidbit of information. And that might have been one statement out of a 45 minute long rant or two minute or 10 minute long rant. It might just be a 30 second clip that most people have the biggest disagreement with because they let the rest of the stuff flow through their ears and didn't listen to the explanation of why. Now, most of my longtime subscribers that have stuck with me in all my rants, those are your people. So congratulate them in the comment section that have stuck with me because they actually heard out the entire logic progression that I have at that point, right or wrong, but they actually heard that string of thought out in its entirety. And they're like, hey, you know what? He's not such a bad guy. Then go in the comment section and look the rest of them. And like, those are the people that listened to 30 seconds of what I had to say and made up their whole opinion uh, from there on out. <laughs> so yeah, so that's why I say thank you to my longtime subscribers for putting up with me. But you know, I still get people to say, oh, you talk too much on an eight minute video where I said maybe 18 sentences, a complete sentence, and they'll tell me I've talked too much. Um, and then I'll have people say I don't talk enough. And then I'll have people who literally say they hate the sound of my voice and they have to turn off the volume just to listen to me. It's a tutorial. <laughs> so I don't know how that works. You know, it's like, oh, so you're missing all the information. You know, so uh, yeah. So I have found that rants, even with my softerness in, in my rant, it comes from that. It, it, there's, there's only a certain amount of the population that I can actually make a difference in their lives. And the other portion will go right on doing whatever they do. And they will be at the same spot I am in 100 years. Not mattering very much. <laughs> oh, all right, back to the anvil. See, that's a little miniature ring, huh? Yeah. See? The Wonder Boy asks if there is a preferred number of scrolls to use in a is there a preferred number of scrolls to use that is like a standard when making something like this? Uh, no. That is it. Again, it's an artistic, it's an artistic choice, um, if you will. It is also a client-based choice. So, you know, you're going to design something for, say, a client's home, and then they're going to tell you whether they like it or not. And it doesn't matter how much it tickles your fancy, it may not tickle theirs, and then so therefore, you're going to have to adapt your design to whatever it is. They may say, you know what? Five scrolls look a little gaudy to me. I don't like all those scrolls. I want something to look a little more arid, and light, and whimsical. You might have it really heavy scroll-centric, and they're looking for more negative space in between each scroll, right? Because they want something to look more light and whimsical. Um, and at that point, you just make that adjustment. So there's not a rule on how many scrolls to put in a, a given area um, per se or a rule of thumb. 
One thing I will say about scrolls, and I was taught this, uh, I was actually told this by Tom Latney uh, when I took a class with him one time. He had told me that, so I was drawing the scrolls out for my hammer on my hammer head, uh, that my custom hammer. We can go to the anvil. Can they see that? Yeah. So I wanted to chase in these lines and put in these, do some line work on my hammer here. And I had a pretty elaborate hammer drawn with scrolls jutting around in every which direction, and they had no, uh, they had no flow. They didn't flow naturally together. And he told me something that really changed the way that I approached to my scroll work, which is that scrolls usually have a starting position. They come from somewhere and they end up somewhere. They terminate somewhere. And in your design work, I found that to be true when I look at a bunch of old examples of scroll work. You can even see really elaborate, elaborate thousands of scrolls, like in gates or railings. They may have a panel, but every last one of those scrolls have a starting position and a finishing position. So they have a flow to them. And so that's where I came up with this S scroll design for this little flower in like grape like a little flowering grapevine type deal on the side of my hammer. Um, and that was thanks to Tom Latinay on that. So, so yeah, uh, scrolls do have a, uh, they do have a certain flow to them. So we can go back to the anvil uh, with the main can. Scrolls have a flow to them. They should start at some point, some determinate point. On here, you can see that at this rivet juncture, it's, the scroll is kind of starting there, right? Or from the corner. If you draw a line through the corner here, the technical start of the scroll or the plant of the scroll is technically here in the corner. But it's equal. It's equal. Even though this is a smaller scroll than this, it's equal. They're ending up in that same determinant point. So they're starting from some place and then they're definitely finishing to some place. Also, if you look in this design, there is a clear diagonal, 45 degree diagonal across there. That's not just by chance. I designed it that way. So this way it has a good support system, just like a gusset in ironwork. I wanted it to have a nice 45 degree gusset in there using the scroll work. And the scroll work is what combines this and has that 45 degree uh, function of support. So when you're designing scroll work, I could easily just throw some scrolls in here. I can add extra scrolls in here if I wanted to. Um, I could add some more scrolls that come off here or whatever. Uh, it just really depends on what you're wanting as a style. Um, so the only real rule on scroll work is you don't want flats as previously discussed in them. You don't want it to look like a like it's got a bunch of choppy marks because that's just sloppy scroll work. You want them to have a really nice flow to them. And the other thing is, is you want to make sure that they start from one place and they end up in another place. That is kind of the really two big rules of thumb when you're doing scroll work or designing scrolls. See how I answer stuff in detail? I'd get yelled at in a video about that. Will Patrick says, are you done with forging? You're into Roy Rance. <laughs> Hardly. All right, now let's go to let's go to the anvil. Am I at the anvil? Yep. All right. Right down the piece we go. Once you get this started on the straight and narrow, it's really easy to keep taking these small bites and continue right down the piece, the full length of wherever you need to go. But it's, it's getting it there is the trick. So getting this to where it goes down like you want it all the way down, straight down the piece to start, that's the hardest portion of getting this going. But once you get it there, it's not too bad. Especially once the groove's there, it's really easy to clean it up. So I really appreciate that about this type of work. Really light.
lightly tapping it here. I know it looks like I'm, this is a really heavy hammer, so I'm trying not to, it's too heavy for this type work, but it's what I got on hand right now. So that's what I'm using. There you have it, that looks pretty neat. Looks pretty good. Let's see if it's about that seven inches. Nope, we're right at six inches, so I need to go just a bit further on it. So one more inch. Can they see that good, Jess? Yeah. That look good? Okay. They have. Yes, uh, Kayla asked, how, how do you keep the line straight? Good question. Uh, so I keep the line straight. I keep the line straight by siding down along the edge. It doesn't necessarily matter where the center of that fuller ends up. I'm siding down the edge of the fuller in the edge of the bar stock. So as I'm looking at it, I'm looking straight down at it, I'm working back towards myself, I'm making sure that I'm lined up with the far edge of the bar stock, and I'm letting the fuller do the rest of the work. Because you can't see the fuller underneath, it's a radius. You're not going to be able to see it at all where it's contacting the metal. You can only line up the straight edge of the fuller, and we'll go to the anvil here, you can only line up one of your edges of the fuller with the edge of your bar stock. And then you know that you're kind of automatically in so far from there, right? You know that this radius kind of puts you in maybe an eighth inch into the center or so, right? Whatever half of the radius, whatever the half of a quarter inch is, right? Radius here whatever the half is, whatever the radius is, that's, a, that's an eighth inch, that's the radius, right? So you know you're in an eighth inch if you line up this edge with the edge of your bar stock. So the rest, so it takes care of itself, basically. So it's not something that you have to worry about, necessarily. That's how you get it square. Anvil. Anvil. No. <laughs> I said, go to the anvil. There you go. I should have said go, huh? Yeah. By the way, if this doesn't end up right at exactly seven inches, it don't matter. No one's going to whip out a tape measure and actually measure this later on. So if it's a little over, a little under, it's not really going to matter that much because it's going to be on a radius. So just do your best to get it as even as you can and nice and planished out. So once it's nice and planished out, looks real good. Just make sure everything's squared up. Looking good to me. What's up, babe? Yes, I just remembered there's a question a little earlier about why you choose to do the bending over the edge of the anvil. <coughs> because there's no benefit for me to go over the horn. Um, I do the edge. One, the camera works out that way. I don't have to reposition the camera. Two, there's I'm rolling it tight here, and then all my work is out here in cyberspace land. It's all out here. So I'm never hitting it directly against here. One of the misconceptions when you first start making scrolls is that you need the horn because you need the radius of the horn to make the scroll. But that doesn't really work. It doesn't work to put your, put your material on the horn. The, the horn's not going to make it into a scroll. The best thing you'll get is a conical ring, right? You're not going to get a, a, a radius, a perfectly round scroll. It's all out here. It's all how you do it out here and shape it on the top of the anvil and roll it down over here. All the anvil is doing is supp supplying one of the three points of contact. One point of contact, two points of contact, three points of contact. So you can go over the edge. You can go on the flat. You can radius this between bending forks. You can do, use bending forks for this process. You can use a small stake anvil like this. It don't matter. 
it's only one of three points of contact. So that's why I go over the, the anvil edge. Now, certainly, if you're whaling on it like this, if you're whaling on it here against a sharp edge of your anvil, you're going to have a bunch of little chop marks all the way down the piece as you go. But I'm never using the anvil edge as a place to hammer against. I'm always using it with off face blows out here in space. See what I'm saying? And hopefully that makes sense. Now if it's a really big curvature, I find it's nice to go over the fat meaty part of the horn here on a really big curvature. It just supports it a little more broad or nicer than going over the, uh, the corner of the anvil. This is a little sharper, um, a little more of a heat uh, stress riser in that one area. So you can end up getting a slight kink in it if you're not careful with each uh, hammer blow. Does that make sense? Everybody get value in that? Okay. George Mew asks if you use beeswax or a similar finish to your decorative items. Most of my decorative items, great question. Um, I haven't had a lot of beeswax in my shop over the years. Um, so most of my decorative items has either been paraffin wax, like candle wax, or uh, what most of it always has been is Rust-Oleum clear enamel or the last and final try and true um, is boiled linseed oil. So those are kind of the main finishes I've used in my shop for the years. I know beeswax is really good for it, for finishes, traditional finishes. I just have not had the, I guess I just haven't had the gumption to go buy the beeswax to make it work in my forge, in my shop. So um, that's really, that's all on me. That's not the fact, that's not the fault of the bees. You know, that's just Roy being lazy and not buying him a bar of beeswax <laughs> over the years. I've used it when it's, when that's all it's been available. When I've done demonstrations at clubs and, and things like that, if there's beeswax available, I'll use it. So, you know, it's, you know, it's perfectly good thing. So, all right, we're ready to scroll this. All right, nice short heat on the end, because again, all we're trying to do is roll this fishtail. As you can see, I'm not hammering against that part. I'm hammering out here in open land to get that scrolled up tight. And that's where I'm going to stop it right there. And go ahead and brush it like previously described. All right, I'm going to go check to my pattern. And I've got the start of that scroll just about perfect. So now a little longer heat and keep going around with it. So the uh, side splits of the scrolls there, I believe you had mentioned this earlier on. Are you are you going to be forge welding that? Yeah. So that will be using a technique of riveting or pinning the scroll together. And then it will be taking a light forge welding heat just to dress in um, the sides and smooth off the toes of the scarf. And that'll be about it. Um, you can really only do what I like to call really light welding heats and or not very structural welding heats when you're welding up a scroll. Unless you have two large pieces that are going together that you can get a full weld on the end, they get scrolled and then that's lapped onto a bigger bar and then it gets scrolled up. Um, that's the only way that you can truly get a really good mechanical weld in a scroll. But again, most scrolling elements this isn't going to keep anybody out. Like this isn't meant for, you probably don't want really nice loose spirally scrolls if you're trying to keep somebody out of say a window, right? For a window grill. You're going to want something really heavy, good heavy, solid one piece scrolls. This is very elegant and foofy, right? It's just meant for the pretty factor. So the so the welding that, we'll be do, that we will be doing is just more or less to take and disguise the seams from a bit of a distance, right? Like, so when you look at it from maybe say four feet away 
or maybe two feet away, you don't instantly see a blaring. It looks like it's just been a hack job and there's been a bunch of pieces laid on top of one another. So that's, that's really the element or the goal that we're going for. Let me go back to the anvil. More of a bend. You'll always want to check how your scroll is progressing. That way you know where you're going with it next. Don't get in the habit of doing too much or not checking enough. You do that, you'll develop flat spots. So like that, like trying to do too much. You see that kink? See how there's a kink there? That's what you don't want. This isn't progressed past a point that I'm not going to be able to make this into the radius that it needs to be, but that's my point. If you try to go do too much, then it's going to kink, see? You don't want to do that. So, you know, take it little bites at a time, get it all nice and pretty like. And I'm going to go ahead and check that real quick. We're getting there. So what kind of projects do you have planned for the upcoming week or what do you think you'll be working on? So this upcoming week, I have two gentlemen um, who will remain nameless, but mainly just because, well, they're my clients and I don't really give out my clients' names, but they're, they're fans of the channel that have been waiting eons for hammers to be done. Um, and it has taken me eons to get to a point where I can actually work on their hammers at a consistent rate. So that's what I'll be working on are some very decorative hammers for those gentlemen. And then uh, that kind of ties up the last of my custom orders for the year. And then after that, it is 100% Baroque work from there on out. So um, it'll be Baroque ironwork and you'll be seeing a lot of clips and snippets and things like that as we go along. Uh, one of the things I have to do to do this year um, with that being said about the broke work is uh, I have a 16 foot entry gate that I have to make so that will be probably a good six month or better project so that's what I will be working on yeah basically but this week I'll be trying to put on some uh, get a lot further on my uh, these custom hammer orders that uh, these gentlemen have been so patiently waiting for for a very long time. But we'll see how the week pans out. I don't know. My whole, my whole plan for the first part of this year got completely shot. So, <laughs> well, well, tentatively, let's just say tentatively. That's Roy's plan. God's plan is oftentimes different. So, let's go over the anvil, Jess. All right. So I got that to curve right in. Again, take your time, make the adjustments that are needed. Make good clean iron work. That's not perfectly in the centered, so I'm going to hold the scroll over the hardy hole, give it a little bump. Sometimes you can hold it, support it by two edges like that, and then bump on the fishtail, and that'll help get it squared up. It's looking pretty good. I got to put a little more heat in this and get it to arch more. And we'll be doing good. So yeah. Like that. All right, got that rounded up where I needed it. Now right on around and around we go. What's going on YouTube land? No comments? Yes, there is. Uh, what's that? Are they all aboard? Yes, they're all aboard. Yeah, there's some people have been coming and going a little bit. Maybe they're getting sleepy, who knows. I think we still are sitting, we're still sitting at 83, so we're doing good. There was a question. David Evans says, do you teach classes and where? You can answer. All right. I was going to, I'll answer that one. Okay. 
Uh, Roy frequently teaches at the Goshen Historical Society um, or Cook Cabin Heritage Center that's located in Goshen, Ohio, uh, which is in the Cincinnati area. And also he occasionally teaches other places. Um, right now for 2020, uh, the Goshen Historical Society is the only place that we have anything scheduled out with for the rest of this year. Uh, tentatively, Roy is going to go back to BAM when they have it rescheduled, but we don't know the date yet. That was supposed to take place the tail end of April, but they had to cancel it. Um, so for time being, that is uh, all the classes we have planned out in advance in the future for this year anyway. Drayson's Forge asks, do the hammer, let's see, do videos of the hammer creation uh, and then do you post it afterwards if customers are happy? Uh, sorry, I might not have read that very clear. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes Roy will create uh, like a little montage, uh, the creation of videos where he's forging a project and we will share that with um, the customer directly sometimes. George Mew asks why you don't use a jig for the scroll. <laughs> I screwed it up. <laughs> it's, not, it's not irreparable. I was making it for here. There's clearly a problem. I was following the wrong part of the pattern. It needs to be over here. Um, luckily, it's not it's not horrible, it's actually still progressing at the same proportions. So, um, <laughs> so it'll work out okay. Um, but I wasn't paying attention. I was using the wrong portion of my pattern. So yeah, word of the wise, don't do that. <laughs> what are you gonna say, Jess? What was the question? I mean, couldn't you technically do that portion of the the scroll still going around and then just forge weld on that other portion of the scroll? Or would it be less flowing that way? I don't understand the question. Okay. What are you asking? I'm asking if, the, if you could forge weld in that other part of the scroll. This here? Yeah, no, no, the other one. Like if you left that one and kept the other part of the scroll, would you be able to forge weld that piece in? Yeah, but it wouldn't have very good flow. Usually your central element scroll is your backbone. Um, this here, the big scroll, is the backbone of the piece. It's, ca it's carrying all of the weight and everything of the piece. So it's the main supporting structure. The other little elements are just little finishing elements or filler scrolls. So, All right, let's go to the anvil. Check this real quick. See how that's progressing. Pull it around. Ah, come on, baby. Got to see where I need to bend it and how. Okay, so I really need to tighten that portion up the way I've got it drawn here. And again, you may find yourself deviating from your pattern just slightly if you decide you don't like how you drew it. Um, you know, if it's not coming out flowing enough, you may deviate slightly, but for the most part, you're going to follow that pattern all the way through. Just this on the horn just a bit. There you go, that's better. Longer heat. See where we go. The Wonder Boy asks if there's a difference between scrolls and filigree. Filigree is usually something that you add on afterwards. So, you know, scrolling, uh, 
you know, scroll work is just, it's exactly that. Um, you know, the, the, uh, if my, from my understanding what filigree is, and it might be completely different, it's something that you apply to it. It's very much like a, um, you know, like, like gold filigree. You add gold filigree to something. Um, there's another term for it. I forget what it's called. Uh, clarification on what he meant would be a good thing before I answer too much more. There was, there was something else I wanted to mention there. But brain went dead. Um, yeah, there's two comments about that. Will Batrick says, I believe scrolls are free and filigree is decoration on other pieces. And Drayson's Forge says filigree has more fluff. Think the difference between a real kitten and a stuffed anime critter. <laughs> also, uh, Yamas, thank you for the super chat. He says, Roy and Jess, love you guys. Roy, I'll have to catch you later, maybe tomorrow at some point. I have a meeting to go to right now, so hearts and health. Hearts and health, brother. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. God bless you. All right, we ready? Yeah. Over the anvil. starting to come together, ain't it? All right, let's see how this looks. There we go. Now she's coming around where she needs to be. See it? So just gotta tighten that end up just a bit. Sometimes it helps if the piece isn't just so scalding hot too, by the way. If you can just do it while it's still a little bit in the red color, give it a couple pops and things like that down in the red tones because it can help you isolate it a little bit better and you not have to worry about bending something else that's not supposed to get bent. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. So we'll get that a little hot. We won't go up as hot now with this to just get it that little, le little bit of adjustment down into the piece. I really wish I could get this whole thing done. That way they can kind of at least see the one element completed together. That would be nice, but it's getting awful late too, so. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, okay, how many people are still enjoying the stream or is it getting incredibly boring? If it's getting incredibly boring and you're not digging anymore, we can call it a night. <laughs> And we can do this some other time. We can do this in the next live stream. Oh, this plus other stuff. All the finished work. Well, they must find it somewhat entertaining then, huh? All right, going back to the anvil. So if you were to incorporate the use of a scroll jig into this kind of project, would that be difficult to do with there being a scroll on each end of the bar that close together? No, not really. Good question. My wife thinks up with some good ones, huh? Now were you asking or somebody else asking? Me. All right. See, Jessica asked some mighty good questions. She sure does. All right, perfect. A little bit 
of a kink right in that area that I'm probably gonna have to heat up and work out just to fuzz, but we're getting there. We are getting there. Yeah, there we go. That's coming around. Good. Max Broom says, could you do this with bending forks? Yep, most certainly can. And in a lot of ways, bending forks will really expediate this process because you can watch the piece as you're taking those little micro bites on it as it goes right round and round and round. Um, it's pretty nice to take and have that instead of hitting it away from where you can't see and then turning it on its side where you can look at it. Um, again, if you don't have bending forks, this is your only option. Uh, sadly enough is to use your hammer and anvil. So let's go here to the anvil again, Jess. There's a little bit of a flat in this piece that I didn't like. I'm just hammering on that to get it in line. And then I'm going to use a pair of scrolling tongs because I didn't like how that rolled up too much. There we go. Scrolling tongs can be a lifesaver. Don't be afraid to use them. <laughs> coming out nicely. Good. What do you think, Jess? Yeah, I'm liking it. Looking good? Uh, liking it? Yep. All right, now just put in that nice long rent, nice long radius, eh? So I know on some blacksmithing projects, it's advantageous to texture the entire piece to give it more of a handcrafted feel. Do you feel like things like sign brackets, it's uh, not a good use of your time to do so? Um, so there's a big difference between doing, another great question there, Jess. There's a big difference between doing rough work and doing hand forged work. So most texturing operations, when they're mechanical and forced, um, like in the event of like you're texturing the entire surface of the bar stock, uh, is exactly that. It's just more rough work than it is actual um, skilled blacksmithing or forge work. I like things to, to develop themselves naturally. Uh, some people, they like to hammer all, ch take all of the factory edges off of bars, right? Like they want to, on their scroll work and stuff, before they do anything, they'll take it under a power hammer and take off all factory edges that are on and hammer all surfaces of the piece before they get started to mimic a more um, authentic look or older iron look. But, you know, a lot of times this iron work that you see that's lasted for the last 500 years, it's pitted not because the smith left it that way, it's pitted because of the stuff's a bloom 500 years old. You know, it's, it's rough looking because it's 500 years old, not because a smith in, you know, 1500 and some decided that he was going to do a slouch job that day. Now that's a personal opinion of mine, and I believe it's an actual fact. Of course, there was different skilled people. We can go back over the anvil, Jess. There was different skill levels amongst blacksmith and tradespeople, obviously in the 1500s and whatnots. There's, uh, there's disparity amongst, you know, skill level even back then. Uh, but I don't think it should be an aim. I don't think it should be an aim to purposefully make your work rough. Sometimes it's the only way you can sell a piece and then you just do what the customer is wanting there if you can stomach it. But, um, you know, I want to be remembered for good iron work and I want my work to still resemble something in 500 years from now if it makes it that long. All right, so we got our little slight shallow bend in that. And we're going to start pulling that together. I've got a flat here that I need to heat up and get that out of. that in here. I should have more coke up here than what I do, but it's the end of the day fire and I'm not willing to put a whole lot more um, 
uh, coke up here on the fire just to be burned away. So I should have more coke than what I've got, but we're going to work with what I got right now. Now we just want to get a really nice long heat on this to bend these ends and start getting them to where they curve together to make this final radius in there. Is getting a long heat in a coal forge difficult? Because I thought you've said before that a coal forge is great for having specific heats. Nope. Great question. Man, I guess nobody has any questions, huh? Everyone's quiet, eh? They're, they're kind of chatting a little bit about Olga. Somebody had asked about her weight. Uh, they said they had heard part of the story in the Forge cast episode. Yeah. So um, it's not hard to get him leaving it up here, leaving it up to the to the Jessica guys. I'm I'm depressed now. <laughs> oh, uh, no, uh, it's not hard because it, as what you're seeing, I'm doing here. Or hopefully you're paying attention to what I'm doing here is I'm painting the heat across the entire scroll. So I'm heating up one end and then I'm transferring that heat a little bit as I roll the piece through the fire. So I'm being able to paint the scroll with heat. So just a nice side by side motion will help get that length where you need it to be. Okay, back to the anvil. Speargrass says, Jess is on fire tonight. Ha ha. Ah, come on now. That she is. She's going to learn more than everyone in the stream. Maybe I would make a good interviewer. You probably would along with like everything else you do in life. Now I'm gonna have a little bit of tweaking. You will always end up having a little bit of tweaking to these to do to make it fit your pattern, but I'm not gonna make you have to watch that long, slow process. I'm just gonna get it bent together here so you can see kind of how we're looking. I think I need to get a little more heat in here and get that bent down a bit, a bit more, but we'll take a look at it, how it looks to the drawing. By the way, in real time, this takes way longer to explain and demonstrate and talk about each step of this process than it does for me to make these scrolls in real life. So um, it should not take you this long <laughs> to do this. I would have it set up where I have maybe five or six of these going at once. So, you know, I would do all the ends on one end of the bar, do all the ends on the other end of the bar, then scroll them all up on one end of the bar, then scroll them all up on the other end of the bar, so on and so forth. It would be a progressive forging exercise. Um, versus what we're doing here, we're working on one scroll and trying to give out as much information about scrolls as I can while I do it. So. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that's going to have to be tweaked on this to get it right. That scroll there is going to have to come in a little tighter. And then that scroll there will be as well. So I have to roll those up just to fuzz more uh, to get them right. Because that one's about right there. So I really need to come around with that a bit more and roll that one just to fuzz tighter. Uh, but again, that's the adjustment phase. But you guys can see how that's going to progress or how that's necessarily going to look inside the piece. Um, it's not to the drawing yet, but it will be next time you guys watch this video. So we'll put these things together. You guys can watch. So it's going to be shaboom. Again, that's not fully put there. Can they see it from there? Yep. It's going to go in there like so. See if I can balance all these things together. Girlish scream, number one, go. All right. So hopefully you guys can start seeing the relationship of all this going together. Can they see that? Does it look good? David Evans has, how much is a fuzz? It's like a mile in my world. A fuzz is a mile. 
is a, is, is a mile. <laughs> well, yep, so there you are. I mean, so that's, that's what we're working on. Next week, I'll have this fully fitted to the frame. Um, or not next week, but the next live stream I do, which is in two weeks from now, I will have this fully fitted to the frame. And I will have the other scrolly bits ready to assemble to the scrolls, forge weld them together, and uh, go on from there. So uh, be sure to check that out. Be looking forward to it. There you have it. I think I'm going to be done. I'm going to give away those last bit of items. We do still have items to give away, don't we? <laughs> and... Oh, and just gonna get better. It had been green and he's like, green too long. Somebody change it from blue or to blue. So yeah, that's the light blue. Thank you. Just gonna get better. You're getting better all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Let's give away these last things, eh? We got a pair of miniature tongs. We have a slitting chisel and a punch for all those that stuck around to the end. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for being here. Sorry it was a long one today. If you really bored, <laughs> it was. But here's a sledding chisel, all heat treated, ready to go. Could be yours for the fine asking price of free. All you gotta do is comment down below if you want it. Ready, set, go. All right, this one is going to David Evans, who says, here we go. Hey, David Evans, congratulations. Contact us at the contact link in the description. He won the slitting chisel, Jess. Sorry if I'm being a little rushed. Just now's the time <laughs> before everybody runs away. And now we're going to do a square punch. I don't know if I'm at the top or bottom camera. I'm at the bottom. We're going to be doing this quarter inch square punch, all heat treated and ready to go. Back up the main cam and go. <laughs> that was the prolonged drum roll. All right, this is going to Rob Huff, Huff who says, oh, I need a chisel. Hey, Rob Huff, you didn't get a chisel, but you did get a quarter inch square punch. Congratulations. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Rob, for sticking around, brother. I appreciate it. All right. Last but not least, the very beautiful tongs from Dana. Or not Dana. I'm sorry. Woo! Drayson's Forge. JT Barrett. Thank you for this. These are these little tiny copper tongs that he sent here for us to give away as part of our uh, live stream giveaways and whatnot. Pretty little tiny miniature tongs. Somebody just needs to make a miniature anvil and miniature hammer. And you got a set. You're starting a blacksmith shop, a miniature blacksmith shop for Smurfs. All right. <laughs> all right, Smurfette, let's draw for them, all right? Ready? Yep. Go. It's all about that YouTube, YouTube watch time right now. <laughs> all right, this one's going to Max Broom, who says teeny. Teeny, congratulations, teeny Max Broom. <laughs> you won those dogs. Get with us in the contact section. And we will get those shipped out to you free of charge, no matter where you're at in the world, as long as you're 18 years of age or older. Yada, 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 yada. And there you go, folks. There's the show. There's me doing a lot of stuff, making some swirly bits. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. Uh, best laid plans here. I wanted to get all the squirrely bits done tonight, but it went... Yeah, it was a big ask. It went a lot longer than I intended, but I'd rather put out good work than half butted work. So, you know, and that's what I'll do. Plus, when I get this thing done, I'm probably going to be offering it up for sale. So it will be coming up for sale, this sign bracket, um, at some point. I'll just have to do, we'll have to do the chains and 
some decorative element for whoever's sign. Might make a nice forge sign for someone, huh? Yeah. Yep. To indicate their shop, yeah. They could say it was hand forged by this weird YouTube guy that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> right? Only like 55,000 people, huh? Yeah. yeah. They heard of me once, at least. Yeah. This long enough ago, ah. <laughs> Oh, anyways, thank you for putting up with my weird humor today. Appreciate y'all. I hope you guys are staying safe out there. Everyone's taking care of one another. And uh, even though in the time of social distancing and all that other good stuff, I really hope that you all are not letting yourselves become isolated out there. And uh, just things like this, doing streams, being a part of communities online and YouTube and, and uh, you know, take time to be with your kids and wives and, and uh, husbands and all that jazz and uh, you know treat it as an opportunity big reset button opportunity for you you know to reprioritize what's most important in life and uh, you know it's kinda good that the the machine has stopped working to a bit because a machine can work you to death and you realize that you're an expendable component and uh, so you know with that being said Take time. Take time to enjoy the day. Take time to enjoy tomorrow. You know, spring, the birds. You know, new life, new beginnings. Take time for that. So, all right. That's it. Any other closing remarks from anybody? I saw the sign changed again, so thank you for whoever super chatted that. So, let you scroll. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I saw it here, back here. It looks blue there, but. Over here, it turns, it's white over here, so, yeah. oh, but yeah, anyways, okay, yeah, but anyways, thank you everyone for all the super chats, really do appreciate all the donations, they really do help us out in being able to take and ship all these items and the anvil giveaways and stuff, um, and the anvils are getting a bit more expensive <laughs> uh, to ship out, which that's going to happen, right, supply and demand, um, but uh, yeah, and, and yeah, and there was a little shortage there, wasn't there? There was a shortage, so it took us a while to get this last one shipped. So There is at least three more available. Um, I've only seen three in the listing on eBay, and then, of course, there's some on Amazon as well. But if you've been waiting for them to come back available, uh, the link's down in the description of any of our videos that go into that. There will be a few available, so now's a good time to, to pick up on one if you've been waiting. Yep, yep. Now's a good time. <laughs> tell her out. <laughs> tell next. Tell next uh, giveaway live when you know they're out of stock again after we give one away. <laughs> that happens. Ah, diary of a person trying to give stuff away, huh? We did get a First world problems, huh? The um the giveaway anvil for last live stream. Uh, it did just. We got the shipping notification yesterday. It got shipped to the winner. So. Good, good. About time. <laughs> oh, hey, it hasn't been quite two weeks yet, so we're still within our limits. So yeah, praise God for that. So, all right. Well, you all have a blessed rest of your uh, weekend, and I hope that you guys have a blessed next week, whatever you may find yourselves into. Uh, feel free to watch some of the videos. It really does help the channel out. Really appreciate that. If you haven't subscribed and you like what you've seen here this evening, um, there's just more of this type content on the channel. 1400 videos nearly to be exact so uh, you know be sure to check out some of those and the older ones are real fun you can see what the old Roy used to be yeah yeah, yeah. pre-youtube day Roy <laughs> all right that's it god bless each and every last one of you thank you all so much for being here and uh, we will catch you next time at the anvil giveaway live stream bye now <laughs>